Hello everybody, it's James here, WSI. We're back after a few weeks of uh, layoffs because I've been doing so much with Dutch Mantel. But for now, let me introduce my next guest. It is the man that Ric Flair himself called possibly the best wrestler in the Crockett territory, in the heyday of the Crockett territory, is George South. How the devil are you? Thank, thank you, James. Thank you so much. I, I'm very, very excited uh, to be here, buddy. Got a lot got a lot to talk about yeah we we talked for a few minutes beforehand and it came up with like four more questions to ask you so uh one we found out you do not swear uh we found out you started in 1981 and not 1984 so that is uh internet bad information like usual right right um but one thing i want to bring up straight away is i mentioned in the intro there the rick flair uh quote that he said basically you were one of if not the best person he ever wrestled Thank which you. um from from Flair himself, who's wrestled everybody, that's the compliment of all compliments. And right. normally I do these uh, in time order, these questions. But what I will ask straight away is the famous match, WTBS, November 12th, 1988. Yeah. It's probably the story you've told more than any other, but I have to know yes. from, uh, from the horse's mouth, uh, as it were, why, yeah. why you and Ric Flair went out and he made you a Ricky Steamboat for the day. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, James, uh, and I'll take you back to that time where uh, the TV matches uh, actually went uh, a distance. There was actually time uh, put in. And uh, what a lot of fans don't realize is the, the dressing rooms were not together uh, back then. In other words, uh, yeah, all of us underneath guys would dress in one room. And, of course, Rick, uh, the top guys would dress. Uh, and we're talking TBS studios. Uh, you know, Atlanta, Georgia. And the thing about Ric Flair, he was always so uh, well-dressed and just so well-groomed. And, and one thing about early morning TBS tapings is Rick didn't like to work them because he always had a flight right after that, and he had to make a town that night. So uh, you can imagine uh, getting sweaty and all that that morning and then having to jump in a, you know, on a plane and, uh, you know, make the town. Well, Dusty would always kind of, uh, you know, not really pull a rib on him, but just kind of stick it to him every now and then and say, Rick, you know, you're working today. It was not Ric Flair's favorite thing to do. He loved doing the promos, and he was one of the few that uh, could draw money by just talking. Uh, but that particular morning, uh, I remember it just like it was yesterday, he told Rick, uh, you're working today. And Rick just said, well, if I have to, if I've got to, give me George South. And I didn't know any of this was going on. So two seconds before we go through the curtain, Rick looks over and he says, today you're going to be Ricky Steamboat. Now, for me, who had just driven all night from Charlotte, North Carolina to Atlanta, five hours away, uh, and, of course, the tapings were, you know, 8, 30, 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, in that cold studio, uh, they kept those studios, James, so freezing because the cameras would shut down. So here it is, early in the morning. I'm getting ready to go through the curtain. I know that I'm wrestling Ric Flair. And then he tells me the only thing he said was, you're a Ricky Steamboat. And we went out there, James. And as you look back now, uh, I mean, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I mean, I was just listening. And I don't think I have ever been... Uh, so blowed up in my life. Uh, what was amazing is Jackie Crockett, the cameraman, uh, he told us we were going to a commercial. So I'm thinking, good, finally, Rick will calm down and he'll grab a hold and we'll go to the commercial. Well, buddy, we went to the commercial and he didn't stop. So even during the commercial breaks, Rick is going and you would have thought uh, that I, I thought I was going to win the NWA world belt. I mean, it was just JJ jumped up on the apron. I, I think I set, uh, slammed flair off the top rope and, and uh, we knocked the lights down and, and, and you can see when the match was over, uh, Teddy long was one of the referees back then. They literally had to, and it's a proud moment. They had to drag me back <laughs> to the dressing room. Uh, but you know, what's amazing even today, uh, James, I can go to shows and, and, and wrestling fans will come up and they still talk about that match. 
Now, I've wrestled him several other times, you know, many times. But, buddy, it's that one. Man, they can tell you the color of trunks I had on. They can tell you, you know, what Ric Flair wore. Uh, and you think that was so many years ago. But to be a part of, you know, these people's lives, you know, all those years. And I came that close, James. I came that close to being NWA champ. But that was it. Well, I think Flair just said, well, I'll, I'll show you, Dusty. Uh, and if you watch that match, I bet 95% of the match, I, I just beat Ric Flair up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I slammed him off the top. I, he was having me try to press slam. I mean, it was just amazing. And as I watch it now, uh, Lord, I should have slowed down. You know, <laughs> everybody said, why was I running so fast in that match? I, I was just afraid Rick would change his mind, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and not let me do the move. So just that that's one of my special uh, times. Can I ask you then? So it, the match goes through a commercial break. How long was the match actually? Because I think it's it maybe was, only eight, nine minutes uh, the, right, the right, video. Right. It was all right at 14 minutes. And you think a TV match back then with an unknown, maybe three or four minutes. Mm. But they gave Flair time to work. And, and it was amazing because – uh, and Black Bart was that way with me. For some reason, I was just very blessed. I would go out there with Black Bart, and those guys would let me. Dusty used to get so mad because I would just beat these guys up, and they trusted me. And then they, but they always believed, and Rick believed this, that if the fans thought this was a competition, if they thought this was a match, then they would they would really, you know, tune in. And he was right. I mean, people still remember it all these years later. Yeah, absolutely. Rick has sung your praises for decades, publicly and I'm sure privately as well. Uh, were you ever close friends with Rick outside the ring, or was this purely a professional uh, mutual appreciation sort no, of thing? No, I, I love him. And on a personal side, you know, when his uh, uh, mother passed away, uh, I was able to go. You know, when his, uh, I was able uh, and blessed to train uh, his young son, Reed. You know, his son, Reed, when Reed first got into business and I tell people uh, jokingly that y'all don't know pressure till you're training Ric Flair's son and he walks in and he just comes to the ring and you either got to know what you're doing as a trainer or Ric Flair is going to stop you. So for him to trust me, James, with his son, I have a, uh, a picture, like a family portrait uh, back home in my museum. And at one night, it was just a special moment. I have uh, Bobby Eaton's son, Dylan, Ricky Steamboat's son, and Ric Flair's son all in the ring together. And that was an amazing night to for those guys that I love and respect to give me their sons. So I tell you, one of the greatest compliments from Rick for me is years ago, we were on the same show and he was doing a signing right when he first started doing signings, James and buddy, there were 800 people in line and my son, my oldest son had always loved Ric Flair. And I was at my table and my son said, dad, I'm going to, I'm going to get in line to, to meet Rick. And I said, well, son, if you'll just wait, I'll take you later. No, no, I'm going to meet him now. So my son got in the back of that line and James, what, bless my heart is Rick for some reason saw little George as I call him in the line and he got up and walked and got my son and he brought my son I know those people were so mad but he brought my son all the way to the front of that line and he said I'll sign anything for George South's son but I'm charging everybody else <laughs> so we about started a right but you know just those little things it was, I'll always remember. Rick didn't have to, to do that. But, but here's a story nobody's ever heard, James, real okay. quick. Years ago, Atlanta TV, I got knocked out on TV. Rick Steiner, it was an accident. Well, he said it was an accident, <laughs> but he knocked me out cold. And so they bring me to the dressing room. They lay me on the floor, James, and I couldn't feel nothing. I mean, I didn't know what was wrong. And I, as I'm laying there, all I could see was Ric Flair walk by and he reached down, James, and he put $50 in my hand. I mean, he did. He put $50 in my hand and kept walking. And he never asked for it back. 
He never said anything about it. But it, he, it was just so amazing to me that he cared, okay? And he didn't know if I would need it to get home on. You know, I'm just, I'm driving in from Charlotte, but I've never forgot that. I never let him forget that. Uh, he didn't have to do that. He, you know, everybody else just stepped over George, you know, <laughs> and let's get on with the next match. But he did. He reached down and he put uh, $50 in my hand mm. it, that if I needed it to get home. So little things like that early on in my career was uh, stuff that I've never forgot. He didn't have to do that. Absolutely. Uh, and just one more thing on Rick. It's, it's very well known. He's going to be getting back in the ring at the age of a million. Uh, he's doing yeah. one more match. Um, you are 59 now. You're still getting into yeah. the ring regularly. You're taking bumps regularly, I'm expecting as well. You never took right. much time off, so you know your body remains callous to it and you can you can take right. bumps still, I imagine. Ric Flair getting back at, what is it, 73, 74, something yeah, like 73. that. What are your comments on him getting back at that age? Well, well, you know, James, I love it. I get asked that all the time. And, and you know, I kind of turn the tables on, on people that ask me, like, what what is Ric Flair supposed to do? Like, be a greeter, you know, at Walmart <laughs> or, or serve tea at Cracker Barrel? I mean, uh, but the one thing nobody realizes, and I wished I could teach it at my school, what Ric Flair has in his heart, James, you can't teach. And he... I love it because my connection to the way pro wrestling used to be when I was a young kid and, and, and the, uh, and the Crockett era is my connection with Ric Flair. So when he does finally call it quits, uh, there's no more hardly connection for, for my days. Uh, and what I think is amazing. And it was pretty cool for me. He just put up a clip of him taking that slam off the top rope of like, you know, 80 guys. And I'm one of those guys, <laughs> James, man. So I'm pretty proud of that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Ric Flair knows his body better than anybody. And uh, uh, I, what I think is funny is I want to sit back and watch. If this is a tag match, who knows? I don't think Rick's going to tag out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't think he's going to do all this hard work, James and just stand on the apron, you know, and wait for the tag. That's going to be uh, more fun to watch than, you know, trying to get him out of the ring. Uh, but, I, I, man, I'm happy for him. I, I, I love him to death. You know, uh, James, one more thing on Rick. You know, uh, I've been in the business working for Crockett a few years, not making much money. Well, Rick walks up to me one night in the dressing room. He says, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said, well, I'm off. He said, how would you like to take all of my robes? And this is when he had probably 40 of them. How would you like to take my robes to Atlanta, Georgia, Miss Olivia Walker, who makes them, and she's going to fine tune them. He was doing a talk show and wanted to take all the robes. I said, sure. He said, I'll give you $250 if you'll take these robes to Atlanta. So, man, I was, man, I'm pumped. Are you kidding? My only regret, James, is I didn't steal one of them, okay? <laughs> so, but I always laugh when I tell people that I got in my car, Charlotte, North Carolina. I put 40 of his robes in my trunk, average $10,000 each. I'm driving down the road, James. I look over, and I realize I'm in like a $400 car, Okay. <laughs> You know, like an old Pinto, the ugliest car in the world. And so I was pretty aggravated by the time I got to Atlanta. But I dropped them off. Olivia Walker gave me a tour of her house. I saw the, you know, the Killer Bees jackets that she was making and Terry Taylor's jackets. And But that was my only regret, that I, I should have just snuck one, you know, <laughs> one of those robes. But, yeah, I was able to do that for it. Imagine if you got pulled over. They would have thought you were like, Liberace's. Like. Oh yeah, yeah. Like, how would I explain what was in what was in my trunk? You know, and, and and what was so amazing is is she just some of them like it was his very. He had a purple robe that was his very first robe ever. It had no uh, diamonds or anything. It was just like a plain robe. And how how special! Now I know they found some of them over the years, but uh, man, I had every one of them in the trunk of my car. <laughs> 
And you could have had a retirement plan if you kept a couple. Oh, I but, could have been done. But, I, 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 on a street corner, just showing them, you know? <laughs> but for now, we're going to move on and uh, we're going to do it more uh, in Thank time you. order now. And you've told me that you debuted uh, rather than... Um, outlaw promotions in, in like a major promotion uh georgia 1981 i had 1984 yeah. this is bad internet uh you know uh, okay. news and everything on the internet's right of course uh, <laughs> as i'm sure you know but um ollie anderson i always like to know when someone's worked for ollie anderson especially back in the georgia days how was he as oh, a boss oh you know what was funny james and i want people that hear this to realize there was no internet i know they hear that a lot there was no cell phones so for someone like me the only way to get booked or to get in anywhere is every now and then the wrestling magazines, the after magazines, they would put an address in the back of it to a wrestling promotion. So all us young guys did is we mailed out eight by tens. You would just go get some old black uh, uh, eight by 10 black and white, and you would just mail them to anywhere that would listen. And I tried everything to get into wrestling. I called, Georgia Championship Wrestling one time, James, and Mad Dog Buzz Sawyer answered. And you know what he said? He said, if you come to Atlanta, I'll kill you. Uh, <laughs> okay, wrong number. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to Atlanta. And I tried, and I didn't get no response. James, I laugh when these young wrestlers now say that a promoter owes them something. Or I wish somebody would return my call. That's that's bull. Uh, nobody owes you nothing in this business. Uh, I mailed out, I bet, hundreds of eight by tens. Never got a response. And listen to this. James, I hear about Mike Jackson. Never met him from Alabama. I hear that Mike Jackson is always taking guys to TV. And I done tried everything. I've been hung up on. I've been told no, whatever. So I get a hold of Mike Jackson. And, and James, I'm thinking that we're going to have this big meeting and, you know, do uh, uh, get to know each other. But he says, be at Atlanta TV Saturday morning. I said, well, now, hold on here. You mean like the Superstation, uh, Tommy Rich and Bo Suck? He said, yes, Saturday morning. Be there. Oh, okay. But then he told me this, something that I will defend to the day I die. He says, you're going to get paid, but I'm going to take a booking fee, James. I said, I don't care if you take every bit of it. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't care. I'm going to go be on TV. Now, again, I was 18, 19 years old. I walk in Techwood Drive, TBS. And all you got to remember, James, all these wrestlers, all I've ever seen is in the magazines. Jerry Lawler and them, we didn't have, there was no cable. There was, you know, Turner's broadcasting was just taken off. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting in a dressing room with Jerry Lawler, you know, Rip Oliver from Portland, all these guys that I had, they're sitting right beside me. Are you kidding me? This is like the greatest, you take all of my money. And what's <laughs> funny I was only paid 40 bucks, James, for TV. I gave Mike Jackson half of it. I didn't care. I'd have gave him all of it. There was no other way to get on TV for me. And then I just kept my mouth shut. And then that's the first time I met the whole Armstrong family, if you can believe it. Uh, Tugboat was there as – wasn't even called Tugboat. They had just brought him in. He wasn't even a big steel man then. He was – I don't even remember what they called him, but well, he's that Fred was Altman. his first. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I remember Rick Rude had just started, and he was there. I'm sitting in the dressing room, and uh, but I'll tell you a quick story, James. Ole was in charge of everything, and I knew right off the bat. And I remember he had a meeting one time, and he called – he had a sheet of paper. He said, if your name is on this list, he said – you're staying. If I don't call your name, you're out of here. That cutthroat. Well, my name wasn't on like either list. And I thought I was important. Okay. So I go up to Ole and said, well, you know, my name, I mean, wh what am I supposed to do? And Ole looked right at me, James, a straight face. And he says, well, you're not even important enough <laughs> to put on the sheet of paper. And I said, okay. 
So I just went back and sat in my corner. But I noticed every week the top guys that came in, I got to work with. Uh, I had mentioned to you earlier one of my first angles, Rip Rogers was one of the, and I love him to death. He was one of the, the top heels feuding with Tommy Rich. And, and James, he would beat you in the ring and then spray paint your hair. Now, boy, times have changed, ain't it, in pro wrestling. But I remember, and then Tommy Rich saved me. Man, for just an old country boy like me, I, you know what? I didn't wash that pink out of my hair for two weeks. <laughs> James, I walked around and walked in the stores with a pink. I wasn't washing that out. Are you kidding me? Hey, Rip Rogers did this to me. So I was so proud of that. And so, you know, and then I'll show you how amazing it was. One day, this is how quick things change in our business. I'd work for Oli. You know what was cool, James? We would tape early in the morning, and then I would rush home to Charlotte and watch it at 6.05. Now, that's pretty cool right mm -hmm. there. What was so amazing is one day, without any warning, Oli walks in. Doors are swinging like an old John Wayne movie. And he says, I want to introduce to you the new owner of Georgia Championship Wrestling. And all of a sudden, Jim Crockett walks in. And you could have heard a pin drop. Ox Baker was over here. Uh, what was funny is Mike Davis and Tommy Lane had just left Crockett to try to get a push. And all of a sudden, Jim Crockett walks in. And I, and I didn't know what was going on. I mean, I wasn't important. But – I knew something special was fixing. I mean, something, things are fixing to change. And it's just as I'm talking to you, Jim Crockett introduced himself. He said, I want to introduce to you the new booker. And he stepped out of the way. And here comes the American dream. Wow. And that was the first time I ever seen the American dream. And I, I remember Chick Donovan, who I love to this day. He walks over. Dusty called out a list. Something about that list, James, I'm telling you. <laughs> and Dusty called the list out, said, this is who I want. The rest of you pack your bags. And, James, you're talking about a cold-hearted business. I just looked and, and watched guys like Ox Baker just start packing their bags. They were fired. There was no warning. But I remember Chick Donovan walked over to Dusty, and he said, Dusty, you never called out my name. Chick, and Dusty said, I've already got my nature boy, man, mm. meaning Ric Flair. So Chick Donovan left. A lot of the guys went on and made, you know, good careers out of their self. But that was the transition. And then later, J.J. found out who was Dusty's right hand man. He said, it says here on your address that you live in Charlotte. And I said, yes, sir. He says, well, I will start giving you some work in Charlotte, North Carolina. So, man, I was in heaven, Jay. I was working seven days a week. And then Mike Jackson, I, I, he knew I was such a good hand. He said, how would you like to go to Bill Watts? They need guys. Let's go. James, for years, in one week, you can go back and look. I was doing eight TVs a week. I would go to WWF. I would go to – I went down to Florida. I walked in. Championship Wrestling from Florida. And the first thing Dutch Mantel, our buddy, said, sure, sir. I think I got an eight by ten at home of you. <laughs> so at least Dutch got them, you know. So, you know, I hear stories about all the guys hating each other and, and Crockett hated McMahon. But, buddy, I loved everybody. Mm. Uh, I went to Bill Watts and me and Rocky King wrestled Kamala. Not in a tag at the same time. And I remember when Bill Watts told us that, I guess I had a puzzled look on my face. And I remember Bill Watts stood up, just a bear of a man, and he said, kid, you don't get paid by the hour. <laughs> and I always, <laughs> I always remembered that. But, man, what? But I, quick story about Mid-South. I remember Butch Reed showed up late at TV, maybe four minutes. As soon as he walked in, Bill Watts said, that's $500 fine. And he said, yes, sir. So you hear all the stories about Bill Watts or whatever, but you're talking about a man that he was in charge. And, and then later, what was funny is I got to work with him in, in WCW when they brought him in. 
and and I, I loved him. Uh, you know, Eric Watts, his son, was such a great great guy that I got to to work with in the beginning. But but just one thing led to another. It sounds like you know make believe, but that's what happened. Can I ask you because you brought up Jerry Lawler's <laughs> name and somebody I I uh, threw out to the uh, community YouTube community uh, sent me some questions for George South and someone uh, somebody asked me to ask you about the time you apparently accidentally kicked out of Jerry Lawler's pile driver. Yes. Tell, uh, I do oh not gosh. know this story at all. You do tell. Oh, James, listen, buddy, you'll love this. It was my second TV ever for Georgia Championship Wrestling. And again, it's just when it's like every promoter loved everybody. They were bringing in different guys. Uh, TBS was just fixing to explode. And the very first TV match I ever had was with Jerry Lawler and Jimmy Boogie Woogie Man Valiant, if you can believe that. Mm. And so through the magazines, I had saw where, you know, Lawler's is, you know, his finish is, is the fist drop and, and Boogie dances around. Well, anyway, Lawler had told me, kid, I'm going to catch you with a pile driver. Okay. Well, in the heat of battle, Lawler dropped the strap. <laughs> Gets up on the second rope. I didn't know. I'm looking for a pile driver. And he does the fist drop. One, two, and I kicked out. <laughs> I mean, I kicked out. I didn't know. And when I came through that curtain, this is what I miss in wrestling. When I came through that curtain, Ole literally grabbed me by my shoulders. And he picked me straight up. And he called me every name in the book. He said, you just killed Jerry Lawler's career. He's beat Andre. <laughs> He's beat Harley Race. He's beat Ric Flair with the fist drop. And you, you kick out. And I, I didn't even know what I'd done wrong. I was just waiting on a pile driver. But Lawler stepped in and saved the day. He said, only calm down. It ain't that kid's fault. It's my fault. I did tell him the pile driver. So, yes, I did. I may be the only guy that, that ever kicked out of Lawler's fist drop. <laughs> I don't know if I want to be remembered by that, but yes, sir. There's something else I wanted to ask as well. You said uh, Florida, and I had a question about Florida. And uh, a match that I found you were in was right at the end of 1984. And I looked at it and thought, I'm pretty sure Dutch was probably booking Florida at that point. And it also, was. it was only a few weeks away from Eddie Graham's passing. Right. And I don't know how much time you spent with Eddie Graham, but I was hoping you could maybe give me a bit of insight in the, maybe the last few weeks of his life. No, you know, I was never, even that TVs that I went, he, he was never there. Uh, I was always uh, uh, fairly close with Mike Graham, but even the TVs there in Florida, uh, Eddie Graham was never there. Uh, Dutch was, that's very good, James. Dutch was booking uh, when, uh, and what was, uh, I think the big angle they were running was Michael Hayes against Ric Flair. Uh, they were going to branch off into that, but uh, the PYT Express, Coco Beware and Novella. Well, I love that time of wrestling when the gimmicks were just so corny, but they were so great. You know, they came out to Michael Jackson's music and they had the, they had the glove and the, and the glitter. And, of course, you couldn't do that now. But uh, to, to work Florida, I, you know, when I made it, when I knew I made it, James, what in the money? It's when just a few feet away, Gordon Soley says your name on television. Now, he never, in the beginning, he couldn't get my name right. He called me George Smith, okay? <laughs> so I'd go back home, and, and my family and them would say, I thought you, you were on TV. And I said, I did. No, that was George Smith. So, but Gordon corrected it later. But, but that's when, as a wrestling fan my whole life, uh, you hear Gordon Soley say your name. That's pretty cool. Yeah. You were uh, obviously shortly after Florida, you go to mid Atlantic Crockett territory. Yeah. And can you tell me the meeting or whoever recommended you to go over there? And there's a couple of things I want to ask you. One of them is Were you always going to be brought in to put over the other guys? Or were you told, well, if you catch on, you know, there's up mobility and that kind of thing? Or did you always know that was going to be your role? Well, you know what? Uh, what was so amazing for me is as a young kid, 10 years old, I turn on a television, James, uh, outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. 
as a young man, I see Wahoo McDaniels and Paul Jones against Ole and Gene Anderson. First time I ever saw professional wrestling. And I was hooked. I didn't know anything about it. I just saw these big monsters, you know, beating each other up on television. And then later I found out that you could go to the matches, which sounds so goofy now, but are you kidding? So I would cut grass. I would do anything I could to, to buy that ticket. James, the first wrestling match I went into with my ticket in my hand, I think I slept with it, okay? <laughs> I go in, and, and the old man at the turntable tries to take my ticket, and I wouldn't give it to him. I didn't know he was going to tear it and give it back, you know, like a goofball. I said, so I argued with this old man for like 30 minutes. You're not taking my wrestling ticket. I got to get in. And that's when I first fell in love with Wahoo and Paul Jones. So uh, to, f to be able to walk in Jim Crockett's office uh, and, and, and supposed to be there was just like full circle for me. Uh, to get to know Wahoo McDaniels and, and Paul Jones. And, of course, Paul was always my favorite. And, and he was a manager towards the end. And I never really got to wrestle him. But I would be in the ring with his guy, like Abdullah the Butcher or Barbarian. And James, I would always tell the guy, throw me outside so Paul Jones can punch me. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Jones used to get tired of punching me, you know, but I remember as a kid that punch he would throw. And so I said, I'm going to take it. Hmm. So it, Paul used to run from me, you know, because <laughs> I'd tell Abdullah to throw me out. So to go in and every Tuesday – to get a check for doing something that I've always wanted to do my whole life. It was, I ain't saying it was easy, but I always did the opposite of what a lot of wrestlers did to get in trouble. I mean, you just basically sit there and shut up. You hear it now and that people laugh at you, but I just did what I was told. And, and one reason everybody says, why never, what they still say it, James, you know, you never made it big. And James, I think I bought five, houses and I'm not bragging but I bought five houses losing nobody understands that I've raised five beautiful kids losing so one reason I never really left James I was making so much money just losing on TV and then JJ would say well we're doing TV in Atlanta can you come to Gainesville Georgia that night yes sir I sure can so I started picking up these bookings. And, and, and this is when, like, Charlotte was fixing to take off. Rock and roll, midnight, oh, my goodness, road warriors. So I literally, and it ain't all about money to me, but, but I was making, Ole Anderson said one time, James, they said, why didn't you and Gene travel a lot? And Ole said, we didn't have to. And I always loved that answer. You know, and that's kind of me. I, I was sleeping in my own bed. Uh, a lot of fans may remember, James, uh, and, and please shut me up uh, uh, before I get going. But Crockett bought Kansas City. Okay? He, Bob Geigel's going to sell it, and Dusty needs a crew. James, I just bought a house. And I walk in Dusty's office, and I said, Dusty, I, I mean, I heard you're going to send me to Kansas City. I said, I just bought a house. <laughs> James, he looked at me and he said, I hope it's got wheels on it. <laughs> I said, dang, you're not even going to like hug me? But so a week later, me and Rocky King packed everything I own. Uh, I, I was married, of course, had little George. My first son was, was one year old, left all of them at home. And we went to Kansas City. And you want to talk about starving. I hear these young green wrestlers talk about times are tough. We get to Kansas City. And I want to meet Bob Geigel, the NWA president. I can't wait. They give me the address. <laughs> James, I wish I had a camera back then. I drive down this old, you know, alley. And I look at the address and say, this can't be right. This is just an old abandoned, like, apartment building. I go up, I knock on the door, and Bob Geigel opens it, the president of the NWA. And that's where they had the office. It was like in an apartment. They were... VHS tapes in the kitchen sink and, and TV sheets all over the place. Uh, but I stayed out there for a year and a half and I never came home. And I'm going to tell you, I learned, that's why I appreciate everything in wrestling because out there, 
there was no money. The territory was dead before we got there. Uh, you know, one thing that I didn't agree with is, you know, Rufus R. Jones was the top guy out there. Everybody loved Rufus. And the first week out there, whoever's decision, they had Big Bubba Rogers beat Rufus R. Jones right in the middle of the ring. And I knew then we're in trouble. Hmm. And it got so bad. I was sending – uh, that's why you can drop me off in an island right now, James, and I'll survive, buddy, after spending time in Kansas City. You know what's <laughs> funny? We get to Kansas City, and we find the cheapest roach motel that you could ever find, me and Rocky King. And we're starving. And, and I remember all the top guys, everybody that went with us, bought houses because we're going to get rich. A month later, James, everybody's living at the Roast Motel with us. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the first night in Kansas City that we have a big welcome, Jim Crockett, you know, the Kansas City party. So we go to one of the guys' house. It's a beautiful house, but James, there's no furniture. <laughs> we're always, all these big, we're standing around, you know, just like eating. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? In my Roast Motel, I got a chair, okay, <laughs> and a table. So I sent home every dollar I could. I slept in my car. I learned to make uh, uh, the best tomato soup out of ketchup packs. Buddy, I survived. <laughs> and then it got about a year and a half, James. I thought, wait a second. I'm missing my family. I am starving, and I can go back home and work TVs and make 10 times the money I'm making now. I'm going home. And, and I was very... Uh, thankful that if you can remember, James, at that time, Dusty just bought Crockett bought Florida, the second Kansas City. And he said, I'm sending all of the guys from here to Florida. The Mulkies, the Titan Stallion, Denny Brown. And I remember I told referee Ron West, I am not going to Florida. <laughs> so it was like a, a TV movie. You know, everybody like went to Charlotte, hung a right. Went to Florida. George South went straight to Charlotte. <laughs> and I started doing TVs. Next thing I know, two weeks later, I'm doing three TVs a week for Jim Crockett, a couple spot shows, and I'm sleeping in my own bed. So I, I think there's a lot of value in exactly what you just said then. It's just having that comfort of being at home and just being, you know, not being yeah. on the road constantly. Um, I, I'm going to ask you two questions now, and they sort of uh, okay. go together. You mentioned the Mulkies, actually. They may be one of the answers. Uh, question one is jobber, enhancement talent, or carpenter, which term do you yeah. prefer? And of those terms, who were, in your opinion, the Crockett Mount Rushmore of enhancement talent? Well, I hate the word jobber. I mean, I do. I, I, to this day, I, I, I will fight somebody because what's, what's amazing is you don't know how many times, James, the fans don't realize how many times Dusty would take me over to a top guy at TV and say, you know, George, this should be the other way around. Uh, and I've literally uh, put guys where I wanted them uh, or even hold them on top of me. They couldn't even beat me. Uh, and I knew they were going to beat me. Uh, you know, me and Al Snow have a thing between us where uh, that I claim to be uh, the loser of the most matches. And so sometimes they'll book me and Al Snow and the promoter will say, George, you're going over. And I'll say, no, I'm not. And, <laughs> and, and Al will say, well, I ain't going over either. So we'll be out there trying to hold it. The fans think we're nuts, but we'll be trying to hold each other on the other one. You know, <laughs> yeah. so Al will pin me. But – I, I hate the word jobber, uh, carpenter, I, I don't mind, uh, you know, enhancement talent. Uh, I, I tell people, just call me a pro wrestler. Because if you think back, Jane, especially in the Crockett era, some of those guys in the first and second match were top guys in other territories. And that's what was so amazing uh, about it. I, I tell you, uh, and I'm very, you know, biased here. My partner, Gary Roll, that we tagged for years, uh, you know, he's former NWA World Junior Champ. Uh, he's living in Charlotte now, of course, retired. But, but, you know, he was my partner when Dusty put the mask on us, uh, you know, the gladiators mm -hmm. and all those. And, and, and I'll tell you, James, a funny story. 
Dusty gave us Jim Crockett's credit card to order those gear. And I remember I was the, you know, uh, uh, Chris, I think our camera went. Yep, just one sec. You know, I'm very uh, uh, biased here. Uh, my partner, Gary Roll, you know, who we uh, tagged uh, all of those years together. And, 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 you know, I remember Dusty gave us Jim Crockett's credit card. And he said, I need you to order some outfits, mask outfits. And here I'm the innocent one, you know, and I said, Gary, D uh, Dusty said three. That's it. You know, I'm like Gary's dad, you know, and Gary said, uh-uh, we're going to get boots. <laughs> we're going to get trucks, capes. And I calmed him down. You know, I said, no, you're not. We're going to do three. As I look back, I wish we would have went crazy. <laughs> you know, we bought everything. But, uh, of course, Italian Stallion, you know, one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, these are guys, I, you know, that I traveled uh, with. Uh, Denny Brown, who I learned a lot from. Uh, uh, Steve Regal, you know, a lot of fans don't realize they were two Steve Regal. You he, know, he, he, in uh, fact, he, he subscribes to my channel. He writes comments occasionally. So uh, we're, wow. we're in touch, yeah. Right. And, you know, I don't know if you remember, James, but there was another Steve Regal that was in the AWA. Yeah, no, that's the one, uh, Mr. Electricity. Oh, wow. That is so wonderful. Oh, that is so great. <laughs> yes. he. Because uh, when I say Steve Regal, most people think, you know, our buddy WWE, mm -hmm. you know, guy that's with AEW now. But, oh, Steve, when he came in, Mr. Electricity, when he came down, uh, uh, what what an amazing group uh, of talent. Uh, I learned so much from, from uh, you know, uh, Hector Guerrero, uh, who came in uh, as Lasertron. Uh, it was funny because back then, fans were bad now, but they tried to be smart back then. And they thought that that was like Hector, you know, as Lasertron. And, but they wasn't sure. So you'd be in the ring with Hector as Lasertron. And the fans would start chanting Hector Tron, Hector Tron. <laughs> and man, he would get so mad. <laughs> and I would say, oh, I didn't do it. They did it. Uh, but we used to do a thing and it got over that I would wrestle Lasertron. And James, he had two antennas on his mask. I don't know if you remember. But for my heat, when I would get my heat on him, I would start twisting his antenna. Now, that sounds stupid now, <laughs> but in Baltimore, when it was sold out and they're waiting on Dusty and Flair, it got over like a million bucks. And I, so I would twist his antenna and he would sell it. <laughs> Boy, times have changed. <laughs> but I, I tell you, uh, those right there, I mean, uh, there used to be a real old timer named uh, Bobby Bass who – wrestled in the Crockett's in Memphis a little bit, but he used to, uh, before he would go to the ring, he would always say, make it look fake. <laughs> <laughs> and I always loved that. You know, everybody's good that I'm trying to kill each other, but he, he would always say, make it look fake. <laughs> and I always <laughs> loved that. <laughs> but that would be some of my top guys. Fantastic, fantastic answers, all of them. I'm sure, I hope Mr. Electricity's uh, watching that clip as well. I'll clip it and hopefully oh, I'll do a comment. And, and you know one guy that, that Crockett never really pushed? He just passed away. Uh, Leo Burke from Canada. James, he came down. And uh, he was the main event in Canada, but he got down here. And, and, and the, the, the talent pool was just so overflowing that he would be second or third match. And, uh, but, but I would be able to work with these guys that I'd, also, that I'd seen from, you know, the magazines. Uh, Billy Jack Haynes, mm. he came into Crockett. And was only here two weeks. I don't know what happened, uh, but he was only here two weeks. Can I ask you this then? Um, of and we'll stick with Crockett again. And can you tell me the established stars who treated the Carpenters the best? Who always gave them moves, always treated them with respect, shook the hand, yeah. thanked them afterwards, that kind of thing. Who were the who are the shining examples of how to treat people? Uh, so many. Right off the bat, Ricky and Robert. Uh, James, even when I was in Kansas City starving, uh, Crockett, one uh, show a month, would come out there to Kansas City, and he'd bring his top guys, Road Warriors, Midnight, and it would sell out. And it would be fun. It was funny because I would be on the phone all week to Ricky and Robert and tell them how bad it is in Kansas City. Well, when they got there, you know, the place is sold out. 
And Ricky would say, uh, George, what are you talking about again? And I said, yeah, but y'all have to leave. I don't get to. But Ricky, especially Ricky, he would always come up to me in the dressing room and say, well, he would, really wouldn't say anything. And he would always try to give me money. He knew that I was starving, you know, in Kansas City. And, and he would always, and he's always been that way. He, i tell you a, a quick story, Jane. When I first started with Crockett, everybody was making money except me. And I was just wanting to be one of the boys. Well, there was no Rolex watches for the boys, but what it was, Nelson Royal, who was former NWA champ, he owned a Western store in Mooresville, North Carolina, about 40 minutes outside of Charlotte. It's still there. Uh, people can come into to Charlotte and go there, and he has – his wife owns it. The NWA World Belt's hanging in that Western store. But – before TVs, all of the top guys would go in Nelson's store because back then everybody wore the rattlesnake cowboy boots, $600 a pair. Well, I would always pray, I hope we don't stop at Nelson's. I hope we don't stop at Nelson's. I had no money. So we go in with Ricky and Robert and, and Billy Jack Haynes, and they would buy four or five pair of those rattlesnake boots. And I never, I never, you know, I'd act like I was shopping. <laughs> Jay, I, so one day, Nelson gave up. Well, I know Ricky bought them for me, is what I'm saying. But so, so it, Ricky had a pair of boots on. A couple of days later, Atlanta TV, the boots that I just saw everybody buy. Atlanta TV, I, I just love those cowboy boots. I always loved cowboy boots, Jack. Never could afford them. I looked at Ricky Morton. I said, Wow. I said, I love those cowboy boots. And James, he looked at me at Atlanta TV and he said, do you want them? And I said, Ricky, don't play with my heart like that. He said, I, you can have them. They were brand new. He said, come to my house tomorrow and you can have them. Next morning we get back TV. James, I'm driving. I said, I'm going to kill Ricky Morton if he's playing a rib on me. <laughs> okay. I get there and he gives me those cowboy boots. Now, listen to this. You're talking about a Kevin Costner movie. So, James, I've held on to these boots for 37 years. I had them in my house. Three weeks ago in Fort Mill, South Carolina, Ricky and Robert's there. We go out to eat the night before. And so I have a box. Nobody knows what's in those box. So right before we eat, I stand up. And I said, I want to make an announcement. Everybody looks at me like, George, shut up and eat. And I asked Ricky Morton's boy, Kerry James, to come up to the front of the room. Nobody knows what I'm going to do. And I give those same boots to Ricky Morton's boy. So, James, 37 years later, Ricky Morton couldn't believe it. He's crying. I'm crying. You know, <laughs> a bunch of sissies. But I gave those boots back. And that's how much money the, 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 you know, the, the Jim Crockett territory was making. So, so Rick and Robert, right off the bat, uh, the Armstrong family always took so good care of me. I used to tell Bullet Bob that I want to be an Armstrong. He thought I was crazy. You know, I may be the only underneath guy that has lost to every Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think every one of them beat me. So. But Ricky and Robert, right off the bat, yeah. so good. I've uh, I've talked to Ricky Morton. I've talked to Kerry as well. Both so so nice. I mean, Kerry's like uh, the uh, most. Ricky still to yeah. this. Ricky still to this day. Yeah. Is, Kerry's like is, the most never, polite lad in the world. He's so nice, he, Kerry as well. He but, sure is. Yeah, I'd, you know, uh, we, I did one of these virtual auctions years ago, and I brought out an old ring jacket that I'd had back in the day, and, and a guy buys it. No big deal. I signed it. Uh, and we shipped it to him. The guy's happy. I'm happy because, uh, uh, you know, I made a good lick off of it. And so six months go by, and I get to wrestle Ricky Morton's boy in Tennessee. And you're talking about pressure again. Ricky Morton's sitting ringside. Oh, there ain't no pressure there. So I'm in the ring, and I'm trying to get heat. And Ricky Morton's boy, the music starts. James, he comes through the curtain with my ring jacket on. I'm telling you, I'm going to make people start crying when they listen to this. But whoever had bought it, let Rick, uh, Ricky's boy wear it.
to the ring with me. And as soon as he walked through that curtain, it took my breath because I knew exactly what, you know, what he had on. So, so just an amazing man. I love him. I, I text him once a week, tell him how much I love him. Do you know he was voted? Ricky Morton was voted wrestlers, sexiest superstar one time. And I saw the magazine going to the town. So I get to the town. I said, Ricky, and I was wanting to play a rib on him. I said, man, I said, you know, you were voted wrestler, sexiest superstar in, in Bill Apter's magazine. He said, where, where is it? He said, I want to show my wife. So I ran back before TV and got the magazine and brought it to him. Maybe, maybe three bucks back then. He gave me $50. And I looked and I said, Ricky, the magazine's only three. And he walked away. He tipped me $47. And, and so little things like that, that people say, yeah, George, that's kind of corny. I've never forgot stuff, you know, like that. So for me to go out and, and, and I was that way with Steve Carino, boy, Colby, when we went to NWA, they already had a finish up, but I already knew the finish I'm doing is I'm putting his boy over right in the middle. So all these agents came up to me. I said, guys, I don't care what you tell me to do. I'm going to go out. I'm putting him. I ain't winning. And then I didn't. So a <laughs> lot of respect. This um this next question might make you cry uh, in another way. Oh, uh, goodness. To, to, give you, <laughs> to give you like the inverse of it, basically, is who out there did not treat the enhancement talent as well as they should or just stiffed him hard? Oh, you unnecessarily oh, so. And the buddy, I could be here all day. Mm. Uh, Sid Vicious, for one, bless his heart. I think he was so big uh, that he, I'm not saying he didn't care, but he was rough. He was very rough. See, James, the fans don't realize what Dusty used to do for me is when a guy wanted a job, uh, I'm thinking of Nails, Kevin Kelly, that was in WWF. Mm. They all showed up at Crockett or WCW. Well, Dusty wouldn't put them on TV, but he would send them out there for a dark match to take a look at them. And guess who he would put with them? Old George. And it's a literally, I mean, it's a wonder I'm alive. Uh, but I remember Road Warrior Hulk got tired of seeing hurting people. And he came into the dressing room at center stage and it, you're talking about Godzilla and King Kong. And I remember Hulk got right in Sid's face. And he told him, said, if you hurt another one of these guys, I'm going to hurt you. And, you know, all of us underneath guys were going, yeah, yeah, you know, punch him, Hulk. But for some reason, uh, Sid kind of uh, eased up <laughs> a little <laughs> bit after that. But uh, for me personally, uh, Ultimate Warrior uh, was rough. I mean, he knocked me out on TV, Jane, and then got mad because I couldn't get up. <laughs> I couldn't get up to take another one. And, and, and you know what was funny? That clothesline made the toy box. There is a, a, a Hasbro blue ring that came out. Well, on the front of the box is Warrior knocking me out. <laughs> and Terry Taylor was up there as, as a red rooster. And when he cussed me after the match, Terry Taylor said, George, come in. He said, they don't allow that up here. said, he's going to apologize to you in front of the boys. And I knew I had to work him again. I said, no, Terry, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. He said, no. He said, he, Vince will make him apologize. But I didn't go. I mean, I probably should have. I said, it's fine. I'll be okay. But I knew I'd have to work him again. So he was – you know what's funny? Even the Steiner brothers, they they were rough in WCW. We go to WWF. They go to WWF. I wrestled them in one of their first TV matches. James, they were so light. <laughs> I said, wait a second. Y'all just killed me six months ago, and they were they were so light. And I said, oh, now I knew. They they kind of knew what they, what they would do. Mm. But, you know, superstar Billy Graham told me one time, he was so easy. To be so big, I wrestled him for Crockett when he was doing the Kung Fu thing. And James, I, I'm embarrassed to say, he was so light, I didn't even know he would, like, hit me. I mean, Tommy Young would have to say, George, he's kicking you, okay? <laughs> and you go back, look, and it looked like he was 
killing me. And, and, but later he told me, he said, the fa- I never forgot it. He said, the fans can see it. They can't feel it. And I thought, man, that's, that's per- your battery's low, uh, oh, Chris. Dear. I'm pausing. Hello, everybody. We're back again. That was a, a slight interlude to plug in, the, uh, plug in the phone. But I've decided to take this time to do a little game with you, name association. So I'm going to throw out a sentence, a descriptor, and you just tell me the first person who you would associate that sentence, that uh, dis- uh, describing sentence right. with. And the first one is funniest person in the locker room. Brad Armstrong. Everyone says Brad Armstrong. All times. You know what he did one time, James? When I first met him, he bought a horn. I'm talking one of these General Custer horns. <laughs> and he comes up, brand new. He says, here, I got this for your son. And I'm thinking, wow, man, this is like the nicest guy in the world. Two days later, I hated Brad Armstrong. All right? My kid went around the house, you know, for, <laughs> for four weeks blowing his stupid trumpet. And Brad knew that, you know? I thought, boy... So I always told him, but don't buy no more trumpets, okay? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he was the funniest. Last man standing at the bar. Mean. Yeah, mean. Haku. Haku. Yeah, Haku. Dick Slater, too. Uh, you know what's amazing? Uh, it's like Luthes. You know, Nelson Roy used to tell me, George, you're pretty tough, but you wouldn't have survived in my day. And I said, Nelson, uh, I don't want to hear that. Y'all, y'all knew how to work, and Nelson would get so mad because those guys, I'm not saying they weren't tough, but they knew how to work too. So I asked Nelson, I said, how tough was Luthes? He said, well, none of us knew. He said, we were all too afraid to find out. <laughs> so, so that's kind of how I remember how tough Dick Slater was, but you get in the rain, and, and you knew he could, he could probably hurt you, but he was so easy. And, and as I look back at those matches, I didn't realize what I was doing, but for Dick Slater to sell a punch, you know, for me, or to even give me anything uh, in the match, it, it was the, the guys like that. It would probably be Haku, who was one of the nicest, you know, guys. Uh, Barbarian. I've seen, I've seen Barbarian, you know, uh, do some damage to some elevator doors. Let me tell you. So... <laughs> I seen the police come and try to quieten him down, and they said, we're going to spray you with mace. And I saw Barbarian take the mace and spray it in his mouth. <laughs> like mouthwash. <laughs> okay. Got said, please calm down. So, <laughs> so those would be my, my top guys. Biggest bully. Mm, boy, that could be Ultimate Warrior again. Uh, I mean, honestly, just because I used to tell guys, James, especially Warrior, I can make you look better than you try to make me, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because sometimes, especially with the warrior, he would hit you so hard. I mean, not only did it hurt, but it didn't look right. Whereas uh, I take Ronnie Garvin, for instance, who uh, I used to love to sell his big punch because I would make his punch look like the most devastating move in the world. That's how I made my living. So to tell guys like Warrior to try to get him to calm down. But I tell you one thing, I worked Warrior one time. He used to do a thing where when he beat you, he would pick you up on his shoulder and run back from the ring. Well, most time he would go through the curtain. He would never look for that metal rod. (laughs) And I was on his shoulders. This is like Three Stooges stuff. And we're running through the crowd and we're going through the curtain. And I'm trying to raise my head up to see where we're going. He ran smack into that metal pole, my head, boom. And, and I'm not basically knocked out. He dumps me and just walks through the curtain. <laughs> I remember the guys were looking over me like this. Are you okay? I think, no, my head, my head. <laughs> so I, I just think a lot of it was carelessness. See, some guys would clothesline you, and this would be easy, uh, Jack, but their knee would, would hit you in the stomach or below the belt, you know? So you would be hurt. And they said, what do you mean? I laid it in easy. But no, your knee. So just a lot of clumsiness. But you know the flip side real quick is Bobby Eaton. Mm -hmm. James, who I could lay there. I could put an egg. I'm not lying. I could put an egg on my nose and close my eyes. And Bobby do that Alabama jam. And he wouldn't even crack the egg. Tommy Dreamer just showed a, a clip 
from a match that I'm in with Stan Lane and Bobby, where you're talking about trust. Stan Lane would hook you for the Boston Crab and turn you over. So you're laying on your stomach, and then Bobby goes to the top, and you're trying to see what he's getting ready to do. And he would drop a knee on the back of your neck. And you think just the precision, the timing that that had to be. And he never, Bobby never hurt me. I remember later in Bobby's career when he was doing some, a few shows, I remember a promoter asked him one night to do the Alabama Jam. And James, I went nuts on that promoter. You know, Bobby would have done it, but I, Bobby didn't have to do it. You know, he, he could have, but I told that promoter, don't you ever ask Bobby Eaton to do the Alabama Jam. He doesn't have to do it. So, so just, to, just the flip side of the guys that were real careless, and then you get in there with – I picked Bullet Bob Armstrong up for a body slam one time and slammed him, and it was beautiful. And in the back, he said, I wasn't going to tell you out there but that's the first body slam I've took in like 25 years. <laughs> You're talking about pressure, okay? If he'd have told me out there, I'd have sent him back down on his feet, you know, and said, okay. But just that trust. Um, next one. I'm going to pick the most dangerous situation you ever found yourself in. Uh, being able to watch the Paul Orndolf and Vader fight. In you were Atlanta. in the locker room that day, were you? Oh, it's center stage. You know, the old uh, rock and roll stage in Atlanta is where it happened. And and it was early. And we were, i never forget this, Jane. We were sitting up in the chair because there was no fans. It wasn't even ready. You know, no, no fans were in there. And we literally, we heard this building shake. I mean, we didn't know what it was a freaking earthquake. And so we ran down a little ramp. And that's when I got there like a split second later when – Orndolf had already hit Vader. And here's what was so amazing. They get into it again, James. And all of a sudden, here comes Ric Flair. And everybody's saying, oh, now it'll stop. Like, here's the man. And Rick's walking. He said, excuse me, guys. And walks right by him. <laughs> and he keeps going down the hall. I'm thinking, what? But it was over so quick. I remember... Everybody was saying Eric Bishop's coming down to see what just happened. And Vader's face, I mean, like I said, I got there a split second later, and his face was swollen. And he put his head down in a big bucket of cold water, you know, trying not to look obvious. But you know what impressed me about Paul Orndolf that night? Mm -hmm. All the agents, you know, they always carried a rolled-up sheet of paper. And Paul Orndolf never dropped. <laughs> he never dropped that sheet of paper. And you know what I told him later? He never cussed one time. In the middle of that ruckus. And, and Paul Orndolf had flip-flops on. And, but it was just, and you know, the one arm was messed up. So imagine if he had had both arms. Mm -hmm. But everybody, you know, I've heard stories. Uh, it was funny, later, Bill After wanted to know my side of the story. Uh, right after it happened. And a lot of the boys said, George, I don't know if I tell that, you know, Vader. And I said, no, no, listen, I got to tell it. I mean, it was like the greatest, but I've heard stories. It didn't last long at all. So to, to see that, and I've seen guys getting ruckuses, you know, in the, in the dressing room and, and, and think they're tough. And when they realize they wasn't, you know, but, but to be there, to see that and how we all thought, man, what in the heck did Paul Warnock do to, to him? And, and, but you know what's funny? I always loved Vader. He was just a big bully. I was there the night he broke Joe Thurman's back. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, I do, yeah. And, you know, he choke slammed Joe Thurman. I remember when I walked into TV that afternoon, James, I look over there, and Joe Thurman's sitting here. Nobody knew him. He's a young kid. He was in a suit. I thought he was there to sell us insurance. I looked over at Jody Hamilton and I said, I ain't buying nothing. And Jody said, no, 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 this is the new kid, Joe Thurman. So we all introduced the nicest guy in the world. So Vader choke slammed him, knocked him out. There was no need for no powerbomb. Then he powerbombed me. And what a lot of fans don't know, James, is they shut down TV. They couldn't get him out of the ring. You can't, a guy with a broke back, you can't just tell him to get out. So they took the ropes off. 
to bring Joe Thurman out. But, but James, I saw a paramedic take a needle this big because he was saying he couldn't feel nothing. And they shoved it in his hip and he didn't move. He, he didn't move. There was no response at all. But I remember they brought Vader back. Vader's crying. Harley Race went over to him and told him to shut up. I mean, Harley said, I'm going to tell you something right now. He said this. He was managing Vader. He said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, you may break my back. And he said, it may take me a lifetime. But Harley said, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I mean, Harley's telling him that. And he told Vader, he said, wipe those tears away. He said, you're just going to hurt somebody else. I thought, dang, that was the night it happened. Mm -hmm. Now, you know what's amazing? I've heard Joe Thurman is, I don't know if he's 100%, but I've heard he's like overcome a lot of that now. Of course, not wrestling, but uh, that was, and I ain't, you know, people ask, I don't think Joe Thurman should even have been in the ring, but you know, uh, but you take somebody, somebody could have went out there with Joe Thurman and had a decent little match too. So yeah, that was rough. Yeah. Uh, I, I heard uh, that certain, certain enhancement guys would be brought in, see their name was opposite Vader and then just get their stuff and leave. Yeah. Just, they'd rather, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, WWF, they used to have probably still do. They used to have an old fashioned chalkboard. Just an old-fashioned chalkboard, and not not a, a racer board. It was chalkboard, and they would write out the matches. And I remember all of us underneath guys. We couldn't wait to look and say, "Pray, please don't let it be Ultimate Warrior. Please don't let it be Ultimate Warrior." Uh, but when you saw Honky Tonk Man, <laughs> oh my goodness, man! I went up to him first time and introduced myself. He said, "We're working today." He's on TV. He said, "This is the easiest money you're ever going to make." Man, and it was too. Man, I would I'd, I'd work him right now. What an <laughs> amazing difference! But man, if you one o'clock in the afternoon, James, if you saw your name against Warrior, that was going to happen at eight o'clock that night. What a miserable day! <laughs> yeah, you couldn't eat nothing. You didn't want to talk to nobody. You just oh gosh. <laughs> I'll give you. A so few I didn't look at the chalkboard. James, I didn't look at the chalkboard much. <laughs> I'll give you a few more then. Um, uh, okay. How many times were you on Crockett's plane? Uh, six times. What was the most interesting thing you saw on Crockett's plane? You know what's funny? Is, 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 and I look back and laugh. I had given up drinking years ago. All right? So first time I'm on Dusty's plane, Crockett's plane, we go to get off and Dusty says, hey, kid, that'll be $12. I said, $12 for what? He said, the beer fund. I said, Dusty, I didn't drink one beer. He said, I don't care. <laughs> if you ride this plane, we all had to put $12 in the beer fund. So I said, I don't want to ride this plane anymore. But I'll tell you an interesting story uh, for me. We were in Charlotte. We're flying to Baltimore. This is when Sting had the blonde hair. He was wrestling flair in the main event in Baltimore. And a lot of people ain't never heard this. And there's only one seat left on the plane. Now, I'm sitting in my seat, and I'm thinking, they're going to make me get up. There's only one seat left. J.J. Dillon got in that seat, and they made Sting drive. <laughs> he didn't say a word. Sting got in his car, and he drove to Baltimore to wrestle Ric Flair. That's why now, anything Sting gets, bless his heart. I mean, I, I mean it. I've seen him go up to Dusty Rhodes and Crockett in a dressing room and say, Dusty, I've got to go home. He said, I I've been on the road for six months, my family. And I've, looked, I've seen Dusty look at him and say, well, you just tell that family to wait. Because I'm telling you, I laugh now. Wrestlers, I, I just told our buddy here, walking in, wrestlers couldn't have took this morning. Well, I throwed my guys, I brought some guys with me. I throwed them in a car, two o'clock in the morning. They ain't slept. Wouldn't let them sleep on the way, James. They're probably never going to speak to me again. But just to see, like Dusty depended on Sting. And Sting knew it. Sting never said a word. He just went and did his job. So, uh, you know, he you've heard what Sting said. He, he wrestled for years and didn't even have a contract. Everybody, he was wrestling Flair in all these main events. And everybody, just one day, he happened to tell Flair he wasn't under contract. Because what do you mean you're not under contract? Everybody's under contract. So Flair had a lot to do with Sting getting his first contract. Yeah. So just an amazing uh, lesson. 
Here's another one then. Um, best river and why was it Kurt Hennig? Oh, it had to be uh, uh, Kurt. Now, I ne they never did it to me, thank the Lord, but the Bulldogs, the British Bulldogs were pretty, you know, when I was going to WWF, you would hear stories, you know, of like Terry Taylor when he first went up there and he wouldn't dress with nobody, so they cut his $300 suit in half. You know, he gets out of the ring and his suit's in half and, and, and they would super glue. Now, I seen, I didn't, I didn't know who did it, but I've seen guys' boots super glued to the dressing room. They'd go to take a shower and prima donna and you come back and the guy's boots would be super glued you know you couldn't get them down and it was just those see you, you couldn't even do stuff like that now you know somebody would would sue you uh my oldest son just went and worked uh aew dark uh, last year and he would text me because they wouldn't let you be on your phones and he tells me in the dressing room james there's a guy uh, one of the wrestlers the extras texting like put, putting stuff on Facebook, like he's, he, I wasn't friends with him, but he's posting like he's getting ready to sign a contract with AEW for his, his friends on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I told my son, I said, you turn your phone off and they're fixing to throw that guy out. I knew it. two minutes later, I guess he just said people weren't going to see it. They came in and they throw that guy out, you know, just leave. He's posting, I'm getting ready to sign my big contract with AEW. He never had a match. They, they throwed him out. So I love that part of our business. I mean, just anybody can't do, you know, what we do. I, there's still a few of us old guys, James, that when we get paid, you know, Ricky Morton, for instance, we'll put the money in our boot, you know, and those young guys look at us like, what the heck is that guy doing? But it's just, that's how we did it, you know, and, and, and we didn't trust nobody. I, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, me and Ricky Morton are the first one to get to a high school gym. First thing you do is you get a metal chair for the dressing room. How hard is that? Me and Ricky get a chair. We go to the dressing room. We put our chair down, put our bags on it. We go eat, talk, whatever. So I happen to go in the dressing room. Here comes this young guy. Didn't know him for nobody. Guess what he did, Dave? First thing he did, moves Ricky Morton's bag. No. Oh. <laughs> and takes his metal chair. You ought to ask Ricky about this. And I'm sitting here eating my popcorn thinking, this is going to be the greatest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> you know, the dressing room fills up. The guy's still sitting in Ricky Morton's seat. And, and Punky walks in. And I want to tell you, it was the greatest thing in the world. Ricky basically shut down that whole show and did like an hour seminar on why you don't touch my chair. You know, and, and I was laughing because I knew, but it was just, buddy, you don't mess with that metal chair, especially when Ricky Morton went to get it. So those little things, you know, like that is, oh my gosh, do I miss? Hey, my first road trip, they put me in a back seat. Sonny Fargo. I didn't say a word. I didn't, I didn't even know I could talk. We go to get out. And he said, kid, you owe me trans. I didn't know what trans was. I said, what the heck's trans? He said, well, four cents a mile. And we just went like 500 miles. I didn't have no money to pay him, you know? So even now, I'll charge my guys trans. If you go ride with me, they've never heard of that. But I'm so, it'd be hard to break in now uh, for me. Uh, but those little things in wrestling, I, oh gosh, how I love it. You, uh, you say it'd be hard to break in now, and it must have been quite hard to break in for a young wrestler under the Jim Hurd era. Do yeah. you have any stories oh, about James, Jim Oh, James, listen, I will, be the only, I will be the only guy ever to tell you that I loved Jim Hurd. Really? Everybody hated him. You know what the first thing Jim Hurd did? I wish people would talk about this. His first line of business is he looked on the pay sheets – and he saw that all of us guys, underneath guys that was driving, wasn't getting paid gas. So he started getting us $100 every TV. Every TV. And you know what's funny? All of us used to ride together, 12 guys in a car. <laughs> but then when we started getting that 100 bucks, everybody started driving. <laughs> and I remember Ole Anderson walked out in the parking lot one time, James, and he came back and said, George South, 
what the heck is there 12 cars from Charlotte? <laughs> I said, well, only everybody wants that trans money, you know? So we didn't ride together then because if you put down that you drove, you got a hundred dollars extra. We were making a lot of times more money for trans. Jim Hurd did that. Now I know he was nuts and everybody said he, you know, killed wrestling or whatever. He's a pizza guy. I love it because it was, I mean, you talk sometimes at TV, we were getting 60, $75 and, and you were paying for your own gas and the guys you jump in with the boys, it would help. But man, Jim heard, man, I wish you'd come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's still alive. He's still so Oh, I know. Bless his heart. Well, um, I'm, you may know where I'm going with this, but uh, can you remember any of the more amusing characters that Jim Hurd thought up and maybe made you wrestle in the Clash of the Champions? Oh, listen, my favorite, and it wasn't really the Ding Dongs who I'll talk about. Oh, yes. This tag team never made it to TV. He called it, they were like gangsters. He brought two guys in from up north. They came in with the gimmick on. I mean, uh, what the Sopranos, but they were dressed just like them. They had the, the big white hats and, you know, the black and white shoes and the, the pocket watch hanging out. That was their gimmick they were going to work in. And, and how they got on a, a dark match, I don't know. But they had two violin cases with them. And everybody's thinking, okay, that's for the look, you know. And surely there's nothing in those violin cases. So we go out to center stage. They introduce me and my partner. And they introduce the, 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 the whatever, the gamblers or whatever. All of a sudden, their gimmick was uh, they, they open the, the violin cases. <laughs> I can't make this up. They pull out two machine guns. <laughs> I mean, like real machine guns with the clips in them. Okay. And now, of course, they wasn't real, but at the time, you didn't, nobody knew. And I remember Jackie Crockett, the camera, everybody was putting their stuff down and I'd almost run it. I mean, it, and so they didn't even make it to the match. <laughs> so that was, how stupid can you be? But they take us to Fayetteville, Fort Bragg. I look on the booking sheet, me and Cougar J are wrestling the Ding Dongs. And I'm, I'm, what was so sad about I'm, all of that? I'm very sorry to okay. interrupt. I want to ask you something. Um, okay, just yes, about the tag, the tag team you just mentioned, we will get yes. on the ding-dongs. I'm sorry, I never interrupt these kinds no, of no, things. No. But, so they actually went to the ring and had yes. the violin case. Then they took the guns out. Good. And then what did they do? Point them at you and say, lay down or I'll shoot you? Well, they, basically, and they stopped. The, 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 it freaked the cameraman out, James. <laughs> I mean, and, and you know, of course, uh, you know, there's shootings now, but back then you didn't, it was so realistic. I mean, now they would be a prop, you know, but, and they even hit the cat, the, the, like the bullet, you know, the, the car, the cartridge. And then the cameraman just, everybody freaked. The people in center stage were covering their heads. I didn't know if I was fixing to die, you know, <laughs> with the gap and it shook everybody. So, uh, they never had a match. I never saw them again after that. <laughs> they brought nails in, you know, big nails. Kevin Kelly from mm -hmm. AWA he had just been nails in uh, WWF. Mm -hmm. They brought him in for a dark match with me, of course. It was probably one of the worst matches that I've ever had. I mean, he just, I never forget Jackie Crockett had a $300,000 camera video, you know, tape in the TV. Nails reached up and tried to grab it. <laughs> and hit me with it. <laughs> and Jackie, you know, want, don't want to be messed with. So Jackie's almost getting in a fight with nails. And I'm thinking, this is like the greatest thing I've ever seen. So, and he never made it. It's amazing. You know, the one guy that I never, nobody knows, Jim Hurd gave Dale Wilkes, my buddy who just passed away. Mm -hmm. He wasn't doing the Patriot, but he was doing the Trooper in AWA. So that Wahoo talks to Jim Hurd, and they bring uh, Dale Wilkes down for a dark match. I go out, this good-looking guy, you know, his gimmick was a state trooper. When he beats you, he put, a, he put a parking ticket on your chest. I'm, oh, my gosh, so good. But, man, I love that match. We had 15 minutes at center stage, and they never called him back. 
never. Now he went on with, you know, but later, of course, the Patriot and Japan, but I always joke with him that I think I killed his career. <laughs> I think before it got started, I think I killed it, but they never called him back. So that was a time when I was wondering, what are they looking for? I can understand if the guys like, you know, the gangsters or whatever, the guns, but, but every now and then a kid would come that could, that, that could work, and, but they never called him back. I, I interrupted you about the ding-dong story, so I'm oh. very sorry about that, but yeah, I want to hear about the ding-dongs. Well, you know what's funny? Everybody laughs now, but, but at that time, I can just see Jim Hurd saying, okay, we're going to put bells on these two guys, and every time they do a move, they're going to jump out of the ring and they're going to ring this big Liberty bell. And I'm thinking, huh? So we look at the booking sheet and it's the ding dongs. And what a lot of people don't realize, and these were two of Jody Hamilton's guys, two of his students. And they were the greatest, nicest young men that you would ever. Greg Evans was one of them's name. I don't remember the other one, but I remember that night I was talking to one of them and I think it was Greg. One of them, they just quit their regular job. I mean, they was like in laying carpet or something, but they had quit their regular job. And I'm sitting there going, guys, that may not be a good idea. That may not be a good <laughs> idea. But it was doomed. I remember uh, my partner, Cougar Jay, he saw the, the, the TV sheet and he got mad. He said, I can't believe we've got to put the ding-dongs over. And I looked over and I said, buddy, shut up. I said, they're paying us $350. Are you kidding me? But it was doomed. If you go back, as soon as we lock up, their bells started falling off. You're talking about a hardcore match. They were slamming <laughs> me on these bells. And uh, then they, they get out, bless their heart. The first time they went to ring the bell, the rope broke. <laughs> so this thing was doomed. But I, just great, great guys. Uh, and it just never they they were around. That wasn't the only time they were around a couple more times, but it was it just wasn't going to happen. Yeah, uh, Greg Evans and Richard Sartain. Yes. Wow. There you go. Yep. Sorry, I, I, I googled that. No, one, thank but. you for that. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, and you know, years ago, about eight years ago in Georgia, I got to see Greg Evans again. He came and just hung out with the boys, and and so that was pretty cool to you know get to see him again. But yeah, it just never. You know, I imagine if Vince would have got a hold of that, uh, they would have been like dressed up like live bells. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it would have been been huge. But bless their hearts, but did they. Uh, but I, we did. We made three hundred fifty bucks. Did I you? I told uh, Cougar Day. I said they pinned me. What are you worried about? <laughs> yeah. Did you ever hear about the Hunchbacks? The legend of the Hunchbacks. Yes, I did. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know what's funny is, I remember one time when the marketing, the the gimmicks. Like uh, the LJN dolls had first come out, and we never heard nothing about that down here. Like Crockett had T-shirts, that was it. Uh, no dolls, no nothing. And I remember Ric Flair came to Atlanta TV, and he had just heard about Iron Sheet, WWF. And Flair was in a bad mood, and everybody was asking him. They thought his plane was late. They lost his luggage, and he was cussing. He said, "That dang Iron Sheet just got a royalty check." for a hundred thousand dollars, you know, for his dog. And so I always think, uh, you know, even Ted Turner, they came in, they got in the ball game. It, that whole hunchback was post up, you know, yeah, it would have looked stupid in the ring, but they were hoping to market that and it never made it. Mm. See, I was there when they tried to freshen things up. They brought in Van Hammer. I don't know if you remember him. Yep. Uh, Alan Iron Eagle, uh, Ranger Ross, uh, they brought all these guys in to freshen it up, but there was a problem that uh, there wasn't enough of me to go out there and lead them around, <laughs> you know? Do you know, in fact, that actually leads me amazingly to my next question. So it's after Ted Turner buys out Crockett, then Jim Hurd's installed, and then he's trying to get rid of all the high-priced talent. You, you know, everyone goes from uh, Road Warriors to Dusty for various reasons to right. a million others, and I've got some a list of guys who ended up replacing the dynamic dudes, Simone's SWAT team, Brian Pillman, Sid, Van Hammer, yeah. Danny Spivey, Marcus Bagwell, Johnny B. Bad. Um, out of the new crop of guys, who did you see the most in as far as talent went, and who did you enjoy working with with the uh, young green guys uh, who were in a tax bracket below? 
Well, uh, uh, you know, Brian Pillman, who was just a step above them when they first brought him in, uh, I used to love to work Brian Pillman on TV because he, he would listen, you know, and that's so important. I knew my job. It wasn't to take advantage of you. Uh, I knew what you could do, what Brian, Brian could do anything. When, if you can remember Art Barr, when they brought him in yeah, the as juicer, the juicer yeah. uh, he had never worked TV. He had never met me. He comes over to me and he shakes my hand and he said, I know we've never met. He said, but Bobby Eaton told me to just keep my mouth shut and listen. And I went out and worked Art Barr his first match as the juicer. But they listened. And if you go back and watch these matches, I knew my place. And it was to make the juicer look like the greatest thing in the world. So uh, I, I remember when uh, uh, Johnny B. Bad like, got his first contract. You know, and and there's several guys. Dusty gave him the contract. They sit right down and signed it, gave it back. And Dusty said, well, wait a minute. Don't you want a lawyer to look at it? And, and, and several of them, Johnny B. Bay, said, listen, I was broke. <laughs> what do you mean a lawyer? Anything you give me, you know. And Johnny B. Bad, who I, I love to death, he, he would listen. There was a lot of them that after you could control Van Hammer, you know, he, he was real good. But. It was just, okay, let's change things up, but they forgot the most important thing, that when that bell rings, you still got to know how to wrestle. And Johnny B. Bad said that later, years later, that he wished he would have took more time because, you know, he looked like a million bucks. And then the bell rung, and, uh uh-oh, now we got to, like, you know, wrestle. But, you know, James, uh, uh, right in this same time frame, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but – uh, this was uh, an incident for me. This was when Johnny B. Bad was in the dressing room. Scott Hall had come in, not as Scott Hall, but uh, the Diamond, Diamond Stud. Uh, Diamond Stud. So I'm wrestling Van Hammer. They got Van, this is TV. They got Van Hammer in the ring. And at that time, I'd already given my life to the Lord, James, and I was speaking in youth uh, uh, rallies all over the country. Well, on the back of my trunks, I just had airbrushed. John 3.16, my favorite Bible verse. I put the trunks on, Atlanta TV. Van Hammer's in the ring, shaking his head, waiting on me. I get ready to go through the curtain, and Grizzly Smith grabbed my arm. He said, hold on. He said, we got a problem. And jokingly, I said, well, that, that usually happens after I wrestle. <laughs> he said, no, no, those, those trunks. He said, what is that on the back? And I... Ben Hammer is waiting on me in the ring. And I said, well, it's a Bible verse. I, he said, well, you cannot wear that on TV. And I've always been respectful, James, but this time when I looked over and saw Johnny B. Bad, you know, with the lips on his butt, you know, diamond stud, I said, wait a second. Are you kidding me? You can go out with this on and I can't. I wasn't going out there to preach or anything. I'm going out there to, to get killed by Ben, ben Hammer. But you know what they did? It's an amazing story. They made me take those trunks off. I can't believe people sit there and waited for Van Hammer to bounce his head for two hours. They made me turn my trunks inside out. Can you believe that? And I did. I mean, you know, I went to the ring. And, but it was just amazing that in that special time uh, uh, that that, I said, you kidding me? You know, we better worry about drawing, you know, drawing money. They took me in a room. They had a big meeting. I thought, what the heck did I do? You know? But they did. I had to turn them tights inside out. With um, WCW and when there's there's uh, many different owners, there's many different bookers, uh, I'll read <laughs> out the list of... Which one am I going to read the list out of? Let me see. Um, let's say bookers. So you've got Dusty, George Scott, uh, the committee yeah. of Ric Flair, Jim Cornette, Jim Ross, Kevin Sullivan, Eddie Gilbert, and Ole Anderson. Now, I always like to ask for an Ole Anderson question, but out yeah. of all those people... Who was the best booker, not just for you, but for the company in general? Do you like their ideas and such? Uh, Eddie Gilbert. Without, uh, really? Let me back up. You know you know what I loved about Ole? I used to get out of the ring real quick, James, and Ole would always cuss me. Oh, that was the worst blank, blank match. And one time in Atlanta, I said, I'm tired of this. I mean, I got to be doing something right. So I went up to Ole, if you can believe this, like a nutcase. And I said, Ole, I'm tired of this. Every time I get out of that ring, you cuss me out. Why? And he told me something, James, I never forgot. He said, oh, no, that ain't the problem. 
He said, the problem is when I quit cussing. I said, what? He said, that means I quit watching. And I thought, oh, and I never forgot that. Now, that was Ole's way, you know, as weird as it was, to say that at least he was watching my matches. And I never said anything about that. But, but Eddie Gilbert, you know what, what I used to love about Eddie Gilbert, and I still remember it? There is no man alive that burned more bridges than Eddie Gilbert. You know, I was with him uh, in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Talked to him in the gymnasium a few days before he died in Puerto Rico. But he had already walked out of Smoky Mountain. Yep. But I, I stopped Eddie when they brought him in to Atlanta to help book. I said, Eddie, you got to tell me how you do this. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, if you get mad, you just quit. And then they bring you back. And I was waiting for this big, like, you know, logic answer. He said, George, he said, if they think they can draw money with you, they forget. <laughs> I thought, oh, okay. And that's like the greatest thing in the world, you know, because you think back and he would walk out, but he, they would bring him right back because he always drew money. But what I loved about Eddie is he always took the underneath guys uh, in consideration. Maybe we didn't win on television, but he gave us four week, four other dates that week. Because, see, they just didn't book TV. They booked, they helped book the towns, too. So I was, yeah, I'd get beat on television, but I had five more days, you know, the five following days, working second or third match. And see, what I miss most is that during that time with those bookers, I would look at a booking sheet. And I would see, okay, my name against Denny Brown, first match. And we would look at the main event. And it would be Ricky Morton against Ric Flair. There, and I'm sure there was jealousy back then, but we were happy, if that makes sense. And we were happy for Ricky. Nowadays, you can hear guys say, well, that should be me, you know, up there. But we were happy for Ricky because if they did good, the whole card was going to, do good. And so, man, I'd always, man, Dusty Rhodes against Ric Flair, man, we're going to buy some groceries this week. You know, I used to call midnight and rock and roll groceries. And they'd always say, why? And I'd say, because if I'm on that card, I'm buying groceries on Monday. You know, <laughs> but you know, it's like Flair said one time, I'm sorry, it was Steamboat. No. They asked Flair what was his best match with Steamboat. And he would say, you know, uh, wrestle war or something like that but he would say but there's 300 more that was in a high school gym mm. somewhere uh, uh, those matches are not on tape but were some of the best like Johnny Weaver who was an agent he used to have me referee like Crockett matches and he had me referee the Jive Tones Pez Watley and Tiger Conway against Brad Armstrong and Tim Warner I'm refereeing and I forget that I'm refing James, this is like the greatest tag match I've ever seen in a high school gym in South Carolina. And I'm cheering. Hot tag, heat. And Johnny Weaver's sitting down at the table cussing me. <laughs> You're the worst referee I've ever seen. And he fired me. <laughs> but I forgot to count like three. I mean, I was so engulfed in it. If that's, you know, and it was in a high school, people going crazy. And I'm thinking, wow. So – just think of the stuff that didn't get recorded during that time. But Eddie Gilbert, one of my all-time favorites. Well, uh, one thing I've heard about Eddie Gilbert, that he was just so into wrestling 24-7 that he maybe, was he just was he just too intensely wrestling 24-7 all the time and that was maybe partly uh, it became a problem for him? Well, he loved it. And it's what I said earlier when we first started talking about Rick. People will talk about everything bad about Rick, but nobody will talk about the love he has for professional wrestling. I mean, you think Rick, for instance, who broke his back twice, okay, when he first started. To me, that would have pretty much out of thrown in the towel, okay? So for Rick to go through all of that, but it's like, it reminds me so much of Eddie Gilbert. Eddie Gilbert loved business. Uh, one time late at night, me, him, Terry Taylor, and Gordon Soley are sitting in a Waffle House late at night after TV. And we're just sitting there eating eggs. And I look over and Eddie Gilbert's scribbling finishes on a napkin at 3 a.m. at the Waffle House. And I'm thinking, wow. But it was just, 
nobody told him to do it. Nobody, but he was, that was his mindset. And I think that was, you know, uh, part of his success. And I, but, but, you know, I never had a problem. You hear guys say, when do you turn it off? I mean, when do you go home with the kids, throw the gym bag in the hallway and don't pick it up. But that, I have always loved pro wrestling so much, Jane, that 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 has never. I don't turn it off. I don't want to. If I've got it, even now after all these years, when I've got a day off, you know, I'm thinking I got to be doing something. I got to go to the local carnival and set up a table and sell masks. I've got to, and my kids. You know what's funny now? I miss so many birthdays, James. So many proms. So many high school football games. My kids got used to it. So now as I'm older and they're grown, I try to stick around and the kids tell me to leave. <laughs> uh, Dad, uh, I know it's my birthday, but uh, what are you doing here? Okay. So I almost have to find a place to go just so it's normal because they're not used to that. So I will uh, I will ask you a couple more questions and we'll get to our okay. finale main event and then I will thank, thank you, you for your time. And um Quite a few people ask me about Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Can you give us like an overview of what you thought? Because you worked there once, or yeah. at least once I can find, uh, in June of 94, and then you start getting more yeah. regular bookings at the end of the year. And yeah. talk about Smoky Mountain, the state of the company at that time. Oh, James, I loved it. And I'll tell you why. Personally, for me, to not have a booking agent or anybody like that, but to just pick up a phone, okay, and call Jim Cornette, just one-on-one, -on -one, and say, I would like to come in and work. Okay, that's so simple now. It, it ain't done, but for him to say yes. Okay, and I've always said in our business, you can't be a jerk in this business. You can't, because it will catch up with you. Mm -hmm. So see, and I mean this with Jim Cornette, if I was a jerk in Jim Crockett, NWA, uh, Bill Watts when he was there, there is no way he would have picked that phone up. Does that make sense James. there's no way he would have said we would love to have you so i loved it because as things were changing in wrestling it was still like the way it should be was it like a time we're, warp almost it was like oh, still we in were the doing 70s. dress you would go to you still do dress uh interviews in an old dressing room in a high school and uh uh i, I don't know if al snow has, has shared this but the his they brought al snow and unibom came in yeah their first TV match. Guess who had them? I wrestled Al Snow. James, listen. I thought it was the greatest match in the world. But when we got back, Jim Cornette said, that was awful. Go do it again. And I thought later, he said, no, I mean now. So we turned around and went right back out in front of the crowd and did the whole match over again. And we come back. And Cornette said, that's great. That's great. So I even tell Al Snow I killed his career. Okay. <laughs> but wow, his, his debut was twice with me. So, but I loved it. I mean, it was just still, you know, you got paid from the gate. Uh, it was still, which I love and still do. Uh, they got the high schools involved. You know, the, the football teams that needed jerseys. They went through Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Uh, to still have Bob Cottle, the old Jim Crockett announcer with Dutch Mantel, to have them, you know, still saying uh, my name. Uh, and Sandy Scott was, and Les Thatcher, who I completely love, uh, Les Thatcher. I mean, there is nobody in wrestling that has done more job. I mean, not, not jobs in the ring, but every job from ring announcing to printing the magazines to taking pictures and, and, and setting the ring up and working. And drawing money was Les Thatcher. So to be in, man, I was in heaven. Uh, I, I to, When I see D'Lo Brown to this day, we always hug each other because I remember I was there when he was bringing a ring. He was pulling the ring for Cornette. And so to see how hard he's worked and see where he's at now. So I wish Smoky Mountain was still, you know, I'd heard stories when it was closing that, and, and Buddy Landell, who was my all-time favorite. I mean, you know, he was uh, unbelievable that when they were going to close the doors, that Buddy Landell had already had somebody possibly lined up to invest, you know, the money in it. 
uh, I tell you, one of the biggest, you, ca- you talk about the Road Warrior Pops, is remember when they brought Undertaker up to work yeah. Smoky Mountain? And even Shawn Michaels came in. And man, just, uh, I remember the week after they would show highlights and it would be a black and white arena with just one camera, you know, and just a light over the ring. And, and oh my gosh, so special. So special. To be a part of that. One thing I've got to bring up to you is I looked through your match listings and you got a win via DQ over Bruiser Bedlam, if uh, you remember that name. Yes, uh, yes I, I do. Can't, I can't find the video. Uh, what were the circumstances, how you got the win via DQ? You, what happened? you know what's funny about our business? Jimmy Vaillant used to tell me, he said, when you meet one of the boys, whatever gimmick they had at that time, for some reason, you will always remember them by that. Like handsome Jimmy. Uh, or, or King Jerry Lawler, you, no matter so he, what. He was Johnny K-9, wasn't he, then, to you? Yes, there you yes. Go. So they brought him in to Smoky Mountain as Bruiser Bedlam, and so that clicked in my head. So all of the years later, everybody would tell me how he hated that name. But And I would try to tell myself, George, don't call him Bruiser Bedlam. When you see him at a convention, you, you better not call him. But I would. It would just come out, because that's what I – Oh, he would get so, so mad at me. But the DQ, that was another time we had to come out twice. Uh, Cornell was famous for if that match stunk, he told you right then. And I can imagine the fans sitting there thinking, what's these two guys doing again? <laughs> but he would send you right back out. If you go back and look, Cornette did one of the very first uh, Royal Rumbles with uh, Unibon, and I was like second guy. And I thought, I looked at the sheet, the elimination sheet on the wall, and I thought, okay, that's pretty cool. I'm going to be second in. It's going to be the whole hour smoking out. I'm going to be the second guy in. Man, that's pretty good thinking, okay, third or fourth, they're going to throw me out. Cornette said, no, 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 you're going to be the last guy with Unibon. Never been – I thought Flair blowed me up. James, I stayed in that rain for a solid hour with all of the Smoky Mountain guys, came down to Unibon, and, and but, but the thing with Bruiser Bren is I think we just messed up <laughs> and they had to give a finish to the crowd. So, uh, gosh, uh, Mark Curtis was the referee who passed away not long ago. He, I remember he just couldn't, nobody could come up with a finish because it just, the match just was awful. He just said, DQ, winner, George South. <laughs> and, <raised my hand. laughs> and I'm like, I don't want to win. I don't want to win. But, Cornette made us go right back out there and do it again. But I remember when Unibom, remember, I just worked Sid Vicious for like five days in Atlanta, and he hurt me. I go to Smoky Mountain. All of a sudden, the door opens. I thought it was Sid Vicious. Walks in. Here's Unibom. Seven foot tall, blonde hair. I thought, not another one. But, buddy, we got out there, and he powerbombed me. It's finished. I thought, I'm going to die right here. But, James, it was the easiest powerbomb I've ever took. I went up to him when it was over, and I said, uh, don't, don't ever change. <laughs> I don't care what the boys tell you, always do a firebomb like that. <laughs> but it was, for me, it was just another place. You used to open a Bill After magazine, James, and there would be a map of all 50 states and Puerto Rico. And Bill After would always color them in the towns that he just reported. And young in my career, for some reason, I always took that map out and hung it on like the wall. And I always, and it was listed in the territories. That's what will blow your mind, how many territories were there. And I always wanted to work in every, I wouldn't color it in till I worked in every territory I could, continental or all of them. Uh-huh. I'd go to continental and work TV, lay on the beach all day with the boys in the sun, go do TV make 150 bucks and people call me loser. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really am. What the heck? I've, uh, I've actually got the same thing almost. I've got a world map in my bedroom and it's a scratch map. So, you know, like a scratch lottery ticket kind of thing. Right. And you scratch off the countries you've been to. And I bought it to spur me on to go to, you know, travel more. Right. And it actually works. You know, you get back and then you do another one. Oh, I love that. Uh, just you know, before- I tell my students at my school that there is more, especially in my area, the Crockett area, there, there is more wrestling than Charlotte, North Carolina. You know, the, the, my school in Charlotte, they, they, all these students, they got dreams, but they don't dream. They don't realize even now there is a, there's a huge world out there for pro wrestling. 
uh, and it's getting bigger. But it always goes back to what I said earlier. You got to know what you're doing. You got to, and 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 that that's opened a lot of doors for me. Uh, just, I'm going to ask about one of your students in a second, then we'll get to the main event, but I must ask about Jim Cornett and his legendary temper. Uh, have you got a story about him just freaking out, apart from when he told you to do a match over again? Yeah. Just a time where he just freaked out over Well, you know, it's like Ole. James, when he wasn't freaking out, you thought something was wrong. Oh. <laughs> uh, I saw, saw D'Lo Brown. We had two days smoking him out, and D'Lo had to get a, um, a motel. He, he carried the ring and on a trailer, and he had to get a motel, and I think it was very expensive. So it was kind of comical, you know, uh, D'Lo debating whether to turn this receipt in, you know, to Cornette to, to get his money back. So to see Cornette look at that receipt and, and you know, spin his head around a few times was kind of comical. <laughs> but, but, no, I, he was always – even – you know what was so cool about – it goes back to not being a jerk. Uh, uh, last year they did a fan fest in Charlotte. Cornette's there. Uh, one of my referees, his, his lifetime dream – was to meet Cornette. He loved Cornette since Midnight Express days, but he had to work that day of the convention. So I told him, I said, Mike, come in early. You know, if Cornette's here, I'll take you over real quick, get a picture, just meet him. And Cornette just got there, him and Mark James, uh, who wrote my book, they were setting up the table. And my ref comes right in the middle of the, 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 the Hilton in Charlotte, and I take him right over to Cornette. And I don't know, Cornette knows me, but it's early in the morning, okay? And we may get a promo on us. But he was just so, so cool to my guy. You know, and they got a picture and they got to talk. And, and it was just one-on-one. -on -one. There was no other fans around. And I'm thinking, George, you got pretty lucky. <laughs> you got lucky. Because he could have turned the tables on me. But just those little things and, the, you know, the respect uh, thing. I used to love to get thrown out of the ring. So court, everybody hated it. But I wanted Cornette to hit me with the racket. You know, just so I could go home and tell the kids, yeah, Cornette just knocked me out with a racket. <laughs> you know, that's pretty cool. You, um, you said, and this is actually going to one of your students, and several people have asked me to ask this to you as well, is you trained Tessa Blanchard. Yes. Uh, another uh, uh, son slash daughter of a legend. Right. And I want to know your opinion on Tessa because she is, by all intents and purposes, one of the most talented women out there currently. Yes. And no one... Well, hire her. Right. Why? Well, well, you know what's so funny? And I always will take up for Tessa because what nobody understands, fan, wrestling fans are dumb sometimes because they think just because your dad was famous that you're going to be famous. Uh, I hear it even today. Yeah, Tessa's there because of her dad. But me, to be there from day one, when they walk in your, your school, never – taking a bump, never being in a ring. And it is 10 times harder when your dad was famous. I saw that with Ricky Steamboat's son, Bobby Eaton's son, Ric Flair's son. So for Tessa to come to me and the fans don't understand, I've heard people say, well, the ring don't hurt her because her name's Blanchard. And I'll say, you idiot, that ring don't care what your name is. Those long trips don't care. But here's what nobody can answer for me. In our business, you're taught from day one to be aggressive, to be the best, to be – her dad was this way. Tully was so intense. I went out to eat supper one time with Tully. I was afraid to speak. I mean, I've never seen more intense four horsemen eating, you know, mashed potatoes in my life. I mean, it's just like – but he was – That's that was Tully Blanchard, okay? So here comes Tessa who to this day was the hardest working woman. People, the fans didn't see when all of my students would leave after three hours of training and Tessa would stay. I'm ready to go, but she would stay for two or three more hours. And the first time me and her sat down to do a podcast, the first question they asked was, how's your dad? James, I, I, buddy, I got right in and said, no, no, stop this. This ain't about Tully. It's about Tessa, okay? And so I pray for her every day. I, I know I've seen the beautiful Tessa. I've seen the one with the broken shoulder. I've seen the one with the tears. Uh, I've been on the shows where all the girls dress over here, and Tessa, they won't let Tessa dress with them. Now, I don't take up 
for anything. But please, somebody explain to me the difference between what we teach to be the best that you can be. And, and you know, I just heard some crap that she uh, called some girls out because they was clowning around. What? Where is Ole at when I need him? Okay. <laughs> uh, it's like, uh, for instance, I'm hearing now that girls – are asking for more money, it shows. James, I've never done that in my life, guys or girls. I didn't even know you could do something like that, you know? And, and so Tessa's getting back in the ring where she needs to be. I have, believe me, James, and I'll be honest, there have been many nights on that phone when she's cried. She just doesn't understand. Uh, but I try to always encourage her, all of my students, the most amazing thing about Tessa is if I put her in a ring with my students right now, all I've heard is she beats people up. If I was a guy, I've had guys say that she was too rough on. I wouldn't even admit that, you know, even if she was. So she's young. What's amazing about our business? Nobody allows for growing pains. I don't, no matter, see, I don't know what she's done and what she hasn't done. I've heard stuff that she's, said these names. I've heard stuff that she beat people up and I go by what she has done to me. And she has a heart bigger than gold. Uh, I talk to Magnum TA all the time. Uh, I'm out here seeing how sometimes she's treated. Uh, uh, you know, she's in a ring one time. Uh, they went through her stuff in the dressing room. Nobody hears about stuff. I'm not taking up for her, but I'm just saying, this business, James, I don't like nobody. I know it's hard to believe, <laughs> you know. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story real quick. I mean, I'm sitting on Black Jack Mulligan's back porch, and we're eating biscuits, okay? He loves biscuits. He loved biscuits, 400 pounds. And he's putting his hand in these hearty biscuits, and we're drinking Mountain Dew. And he starts to tell me a story that in the 60s, the mafia heard about wrestling and how much money wrestling's bringing in. So the mafia comes down, James, to get involved in wrestling. And after three days, they leave. <laughs> after three days, they go back up north. They said, <laughs> them guys are nuts. So if that explains anything about our business, the, the mafia didn't want anything to do with us. So, but Tessa, uh, oh, she's back. She's got three shows coming up soon, and she needs to be in that ring. Yeah. She needs to be in that ring. And, and, and I, you know, I told her, I joke with her. I said, listen, you, you done made a movie with the rock, <laughs> you know, what's left, <laughs> you know, I will um, go to our main event now. And we yeah. have just shy of 10 minutes, maybe about eight. And what it is, is, is basically the inverse of the name association. I'm going to give you some names and you just give me a short thing of what you think about them. Maybe a tiny little story to throw in them. And I'll try and get through as many, Names as I can until Chris turns up and uh, uh, drags you, gives you the hook and oh, drags yeah. you away. Chris said, man, shut him up. <laughs> right, first one is, and I, and I have to ask, Dutch Mantel. Oh, I love, I, I, I love Dutch. You know, he came in, uh, you know, Dusty, we had a meeting, Charlotte, and Dusty said, I'm going to bring in the Kansas Jayhawks. And we didn't know what the heck the Kansas Jayhawk was. And he said, I'm going to bring Dutch Mantel and Bobby Jaggers. And we all knew Dutch, but None of us knew Bobby Jaggers. And I remember Road Warrior Animal asked Dusty, uh, who the heck's Bobby Jaggers? And Dusty said, well, he's good for the dressing room. <laughs> We're like, okay, what about drawing money? But, man, I love to work uh, Dutch. You know, on, uh, well, well, him and Bobby Jaggers both were just so – he was another one that would give – you never had to worry about getting hurt, you know, in, in, in our business when you could – People don't understand when you could really trust Dutch was Dutch was the best. Uh, one of my highlights of my career uh, was when his sweet granddaughter passed away, you know, years ago. And they did a, a, a benefit show for the family. And I was able to go up and just to, to love on Dutch and the family and 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 then still, you know, pray for him every day. But just to be there for them, you know, during that part. So just an amazing person. Uh, next one's Ronnie Garvin. Oh, I that it beat me to death. <laughs> Ronnie used to say, "Hit me harder," and I look down and my my hand would be purple. I'd say, "Ronnie, I can't hit you no harder." I mean, my hand is broke, but just tough as is is shoe leather. You know, uh, 
I, I knew if you could get through the, the, the Garvin stone, I don't know if you remember that, but yeah, all the way around the body, wasn't it? And, and, man, he wouldn't care. He, the punch was easy, but the stomp. Sometimes he'd get you below the belt. Sometimes he'd get you on your kneecap, your shin. He'd come around the head. So that if you could survive the stomp, but uh, oh, I love Ronnie. You know, a, a quick story about Ronnie. You know, in Charlotte, he owned a car dealership one time. Hands of Stone, Ronnie Garvin, and I used to want to like steal the sign. But you know what was so cool about Ronnie? He didn't care if you were one of the boys. If you bought a car, he would set you up on a payment plan, but you didn't get that car till you paid it in full. Oh. <laughs> so, I never heard of that. You know, wrestlers would go in and, oh, man, Ronnie's going to give me a payment plan. Yeah, you you had the payment plan, but you ain't taking the keys till it's paid off. So he, he was smart. So basically it was a reservation plan. Oh, yeah, you get. reserved the car. And it's yours when you finally pay it off. <laughs> Next one. Uh, you mentioned it before, Teddy Long. Oh, I love Teddy. I, and I say that a lot. But, you know, I was there. Teddy deserves everything that he gets. You know, I was there when he was refereeing in Atlanta. And he would uh, he would love to go get us, because we couldn't leave TV. But he would do anything he could to, for the boys. Uh, whether it's, you know, go get us some water or whatever. Because we couldn't leave. Uh, and so to see him go from referee and uh, just one of my, you know, gosh, best friends, that, that's what I hang on to, Jane, is to, to be there when these guys start and know how hard they worked. Young fans may just see Teddy Long, you know, they've been the general manager at WWE, but they don't know the journey that he took, you know, to get there. So, yeah, special guy. Manny Fernandez. Oh, Lord. Manny me and him has been like a, a good marriage. We argue and then hug each other. Uh, to me, Manny was one of the greatest workers in the world. But now if you messed up in TV, uh, Manny let you know it uh, real quick. Uh, I always, to this day, I love Manny. I mean, I still hear stuff where he does a podcast and, and will say something bad about George. I'm just glad he's mentioning my name, you know. But one, if you go back and look at his early Florida stuff, it's just un unbelievable. His matches with Harley Race, uh, yeah, Manny was something else. Is he the purveyor of maybe some of the tallest tales in wrestling? Well, I always – what's funny about our business is people would say, yeah, I don't believe Manny, and then they would tell you the same – they would tell you a story that you couldn't believe. So does that make sense? It's yeah. like I'm thinking, we're all telling fish stories. Here. It's just who can we get to hear us, you know? <laughs> and so uh, I, I just posted something on Facebook about how in Atlanta TV, Abdul the Butcher wanted to hit me in the head with a metal staircase. And I said no. And he cussed me out. Well, later that day, Cactus Jack hit him in the head with a metal staircase. And Abdullah cussed out Cactus Jack. <laughs> so none of us know what the heck we're doing. Okay. <laughs> so I laugh when guys, you know, all of a sudden, you know, pro wrestling's got a conscience. But, yeah, man, he was, he was way out there. Jimmy Garvin? Oh, the best. Let me tell you something. Jimmy Garvin had, when he was doing the thing with Precious, he had a – I got a story about everybody, Dane, but he had a, a long black – he wore it. Steve Regal, our buddy, Mr. Electricity, wore it in AWA. A, a, a tuxedo. Uh, rhinestones. And Jimmy Garvin came back from TV one time and throwed it over to me. And I thought, well, I, he just wants me to hold it. So I held it. And he, you know, gets dressed, whatever. He's getting ready to leave. And I go to give him the jacket. And he says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going, giving you back your tuxedo. He said, no, no, I gave it to you. I thought, I thought yeah, right. You're going to take it back later. But I still have it at home. I mean, are you kidding me? I should have said, what about the boots, too? <laughs> but, you know, he lost all of his hair. He came up to me at a convention. And I was setting my table up. And he said, can I get your autograph? And I said, no, get away from me. I mean, I didn't know, you know, no, there was no hair. And I never, I didn't know, you know, the last time I saw him was the hair. But I said, no, can you get, away? I said, you gotta get away from me. I'm sitting up. I think I call him a goof and, you know, get away from me, you outlaw. And he finally says, you really don't know who I am, dude. Then I heard the voice. <laughs> but you know what's amazing? A buddy of mine just ran. It's, this is how it goes back to don't be a jerk, okay? My neighbor, two days ago. I'm going to get in the car. My neighbor waves, real nice guy, him and his wife. He says, I got a story. 
I said, oh, God, you know, okay, now? He said, I met one of your friends. This is two days ago, James, in my yard. He said, Jimmy Garvin. I said, what? How do you even know Jimmy Garvin? He had wrestled in 25 years. Well, Jimmy Garvin loves Mustang cars. My neighbor just happens to collect Mustang cars. So they're horse trading back and forth, you know, fenders and stuff. They get talking about wrestling. Next thing I know, my neighbor said, man, I live with a, there's a wrestler across the street, George South. And then Jimmy Garvin, he said, Jimmy Garvin lit up like a Christmas tree and says, please tell George South how much I love it. So, see, so if I was a jerk years ago, Jimmy Garvin said, yeah, you tell him, you know, <laughs> but it's amazing. That's one thing I take pride in. Jimmy Garvin, I still got the ring jacket. He ain't getting it back. I'm going to give you th- maybe three more, and then, uh, then I'll okay. ask you for your plugs. Uh, maybe four, who knows. One, I've just got to ask, T. Joe Kahn and Mark Gulen. Oh, listen, and T. Joe passed away. You know, okay, you got Bar- Barbarian and Warlord. Two, the only thing that, that, that competes is the Road Warriors. So anybody would not stand a chance. So they got Paul Jones's army, okay? So he's got Barbarian. Warlord, Ivan, and T. Joe Conn. And all these guys are rough, except Ivan. Ivan was the best. So they were getting them ready for the Road Warriors. So Dusty tells them, guys, I want you to hit the ring and be vicious. So me, Gary Roll, and Tommy Angel are waiting in the ring. And so here comes Paul Jones. He turns his army loose. And as they're running to the ring, okay, we didn't even talk about it, but all of us thought, I'm going to Ivan. <laughs> We're running to Ivan. So it was a – Ivan laughed about it for years. So here's three grown men. We didn't know what each of us was going to do because the other ones were going to hurt us. And T. Joe Conn's coming in there like a road boy. So all three men went running straight for Ivan. And, and James, on TV, you can see Ivan put on the brakes, you know, like, like Bugs Bunny, like – I mean, it, it freaked him out, but here's these three grown men. <laughs> we ran right by T. Joe Kahn. And then all of a sudden, I even had to beat all three of us up. <laughs> so, but but T. Joe never – I always felt sorry – not really far, sorry for him, but he never stood a chance because they wanted him to be, like, the next road warrior, really. And then one of the nicest guys, uh, you know, Mighty Wilbur. You know, remember him? Mm-hmm. You know, they brought him in, and he was just in the country. But I'll tell you something about Mighty Wilbur. He always wore coveralls. So we get in a, we got a 300 mile trip. I put him in the back seat of my car. It, you know, it slanted like this. He was so big. 100 miles down the road, I hear crunching. I think, what the heck is going on? We well, ain't stopped to eat. And I look back, and here's Wilbur. You know, he's eating a taco. And only, I don't know where it comes from. It came out of the bib, you know, and he took a few bites, put it back. I never asked questions, but I always told Mighty Wilbur. People thought that was a gimmick. He told me, he said, George and Charlotte, I'm going to bring my three boys to meet you. I said, man, I love that. He gets out of his truck, and his three boys get out of his truck, and they're all dressed like their dad. I mean, they all got coveralls on. They all got the red bandana. And, but it wasn't a gimmick. And, and what was so funny, they tried to make him a heel. This is one of Dusty's ideals that didn't work. He was like the nicest guy. I remember they tried to tag him with Ivan, and he would grin. Like he would laugh the whole time. And Ivan used to get so mad. Here's this vicious Russian, and his partner look over, and his partner's laughing. He just couldn't be mean. But he passed away too, Mighty Wilbur. But he was just – everybody said, man, that's a great gimmick. I said, no, no, he's really like a farmer, Okay. <laughs> I'll give you two more, and then that is it. Nikita Koloff. Oh, I, buddy, listen. When and I love to hear Nikita tell. And I just spoke to him a couple weeks ago. He, you know, he never watched wrestling. Think about this, James. Him, the Road Warriors, Rick Rude. Uh, oh my gosh, Nor the Barbarian. They all went to the same high school. I used to ask Nikita, "What the heck was in y'all's water up there? Can you imagine that front line?" But Nikita had never watched wrestling. So, you know, he shows up in Charlotte and no credentials. He didn't know what he was getting into. They told him to take his shirt off. So he took his shirt off and they said, you're hired. But he'd never been in the ring. So what they did, Dusty would get me and Gary Roll and put us in the ring with Nikita. Uh, 
in those, uh, like in the between TV tapings. So we kind of got an early taste of Nikita. Now I saw him hit Flair one night so hard with that Russian sickle. Flair came back to the dressing room mad. And I'll never forget it. Flair said, listen, I'm not a mulky. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you're not going to hit me like that. But man, one of the greatest guys in the world, you know, Nikita, what's funny, we laugh, he, you know, he growed his hair out uh, a while back and he looked just like Mel Gibson. And uh, we would speak at these youth camps and they'd introduce me. And then they'd say, ladies and gentlemen, the Russian nightmare. And here Nikita would walk out looking like Mel Gibson and nobody would do nothing. They thought it was like a, you know, a big rib or something. So he finally had to shave his head. <laughs> so, so they'd believe he was Nikita. Did he always do the accent 24-7? I am Nikita yes. all the Listen, time. Listen, in, uh, in Cincinnati, I'm, I, he's driving. I'm in the back seat. Ivan's up here. Crusher Cruz says back here. We get pulled over. Ivan's, uh, Nikita's driving. The highway patrol comes over. Nikita starts talking Russian. And the, the highway patrolman lets him go. <laughs> well, what just happened here? Because, you know, he, you're talking about taking it to the limit. I mean, he... Uh, Everything was full blast with him. He, he had his driver license changed. His name was changed. Uh, you know, he was Nikita Cole. But I always thought that was the coolest thing. We just got out of a ticket. And he's talking Russian. I don't even know if he was talking Russian. It just sounded like it. You know, we didn't know. The cops said, oh, sorry, Mr. Koloff. <laughs> <laughs> I've, inter- oh. I've interviewed him as well. He was, he was a great interview. And, uh, oh, I'm uh, And the last one, we'll finish it off, Lex Luger. Lex, you know what was funny about Lex is when they book, when they made him the narcissist, it was not a real. I mean, it was that's who he was. Uh, James, I remember one time he he put so much baby oil on before he went to the ring, and his finish was the rack. And I remember he put me up in the rack, and I slid off like a, a greasy <laughs> pig. I mean, I slid down. I thought I broke my neck, and I mean, I about died. And he's cussing me, because but it wasn't me. I mean, I was trying to hang on, but so much baby oil. And I slid right down, WWF television. And he cussed me for years after that. And I don't even think we even finished the match after that. But I'll tell you something. In Atlanta, Georgia, we start hearing that Dusty's bringing in a new guy. This is a true story. Nobody's ever heard this. And we don't know who it is, but Lex Luger had just started in Florida. So we hear that they got this guy. Coming in, and he looks like 100 million bucks. Atlanta TV, Lex Luger's first day. He ain't even been on TV yet. We had him in the dressing room, and Flair's asking him, Well, what can you do? What can you do? And he said, Well, I can do a headlock. Flair says, No, 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 finishes. He says, Can you do a bear hug? He says, George, come here. Me, of all people, in a dressing room on the hard floor. He said, Come here, George. He said, can you do a small package? That's where the name total package come from. Okay. Lex says, well, I don't know. And Flair says, well, let's try it. Flair didn't try it. George tried it. <laughs> so after about an hour of Lex, he just couldn't bend. He was so big. After about an hour of him driving my head, you know, into the cement, cause he couldn't bend. I finally get up, you know, groggily. And I said, Rick, my head hurts. This is in a dressing room. If you can imagine this. He said, well, we got to do something else. He said, well, let's just try a back break. That's where the rack come from. So in the middle of that dressing room, no baby oil this time. He picks me up. First time he ever did the rack. We go 10 minutes later, we go right out on TBS, and I work Lex Luger's debut match, and he beats me with the rack. Amazing. <laughs> but to see, you're talking about a total, complete, turn around and change and man, just a super, I, I just spoke at a, uh, uh, a men's supper in South Carolina and Lex, me and Lex was the, the guest speakers. And you know what's so cool about it? I mark out still to this day. Like I had an old Remco figure of Lex that he hadn't saw in years. And, you know, I, I think he thought I was going to give it to him. I said, no, no, I want you to sign this for me. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. I'd uh, I'd love to have Lex on. I just he's so hard to get hold of, but man, he's he's on the he's right on the top. And um, and from what I can tell, like a complete one eighty of a personality change. Oh my well. gosh! And, and you know that's what I think is amazing is that his life now. Uh, he he see a lot of wrestlers run from their goofiness. You know they run from 
the, the stupidness. Like I'll, I'll go speak at a youth camp and they'll say, well, I hope you ain't like the last wrestler that was here. And I say, what do you mean? And they'll say, well, we want them to tell their stories. They ain't got to be bad. You know, uh, Dusty Rhodes, when he, he gave me his book one time, his life story, I read it. I didn't like the end of it. Hmm. And Dusty asked me, he said, well, what, do you like my book? I said, well, Dusty, the first part of it was unbelievable, but I hated the last of it. It's just, and he, I put a rubber band around it, throw it under the dresser and never looked at it again. And he said, why? I said, well, Dusty, a lot of that, I mean, you've been all over the world. You wrestled Harley Race. You did everything. He really had to write about that, you know? And he said, well, that's what sales. And I didn't. So a lot of guys run. They ain't nobody messed up, James, more than me. I'm, I've been, I still make more stupid mistakes, but man, you just keep running that race. I just told Road Dog, Jesse James, the other week, I said, listen, I said, he was the last Armstrong that I worked with. And I told him, I said, brother, just, we just got to keep running the race. Mm-hmm. And I, I you know, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to debut for a promotion in three weeks in Charlotte, GCW. So they post, I've never worked for them. I'm so excited. Ricky Mort works for them, big group. So they put a poster, they, they put the advertisement on Facebook. Some random guy comes on there and says, George Sal, is he not 90 years old? Oh my gosh. James, most people will turn the other cheek. George don't. So I let that guy have it. I said, no, I'm not. But my bank account, you know, is, is 90 years old. Shut up. You know, everybody ain't got to like us. But come on. Leave me alone. <laughs> you know, for, you know, look, wrong last story. I promise. Okay. <laughs> my buddy on, my buddy, I got my best friend where I live. He has worked on a trash truck, the back of it, James, for 40 years. I've known him. He's the biggest wrestling fan in the world. And so what we did know is the whole time on this trash truck, he's saving his money and he's invested. And now he owns 12 trash trucks, but he still stops at my house and talk wrestling. And he told me something the other day. He said, George, I don't understand your business. He said, you know, even in the trash business, we take care of our own. Like if there's a guy that's been on a trash truck for 40 years, man, we look up to him. But he said, in your business, the longer y'all do it, the more fun they make of y'all. And that makes sense. I, I mean, he's right. I hate to admit it, but I just want people to say, man, you know, George South, I remember one time, Magnum TA, I made 400 bucks. They beat me in five seconds. Five seconds, 400 bucks. The security guard, it's taking me back, and the fans are throwing stuff. You loser. You loser. You lost in five seconds. And the security guard looks over, and he whispers. He said, they just don't get it, do they? <laughs> I said, no, they don't. Okay? No, they don't. So, but I just want people to say, man, this guy, I think it's pretty cool that he's, like, had the same job for almost 41 years. Uh, and I'm not – I always joke, I'm not a miserable old-timer that hates everybody, just – most of the people. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, I've been spending the last two and a bit hours with you, and I can tell that you oh, no. you don't hate anyone. It sounds like you love it and you love wrestling no, and you I enjoyed do. everything. So it's, it's great <laughs> Listen, to talk Dave, to you. Listen, Dave, what other month. business can I travel and get to meet you, my buddy Craig? Where else can I travel and meet so many wonderful people and, and, and get paid? Mm-hmm. You know, when, when a young man, it just happened this week, when a young man comes up and brings his son to me, and says, you know, I, I've been watching you since I sat on my dad's lap back in the day. Now, their money can't replace that right there. But, yeah, so. absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. For man. now, uh, I'm going to close down this podcast, but just before I do, and it has been a pleasure to talk to you for this long. Thank hit you. Me with, hit me with some plugs where you're going to be appearing, books, Facebook, social media, all of that. Right. Well, the biggest thing we got coming up is in a few months, you know, Rassel K here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, almost 10 years that we've been going to Winston-Salem, Russell K. They can go to, uh, it's probably the biggest convention. Uh, over 300 top wrestling stars uh, will be there. It's just a huge wrestling show, uh, fan fest, uh, matches. That will be uh, the week of Thanksgiving. Uh, of course, I'm always on the road, and, and they can go to georgesouth.com. You know, uh, I've got a life story that I'm awful proud of. Uh, autograph anything people need people say well if I write you an email does your people give you the email I said man I ain't got people 
Okay, just email me. I'll email you back. So georgesouth.com, they can keep up with my schedule and appearances of where I'm going to be. And, and, and man, I, 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 I'd love to meet them. And books as well. You, how many books have you got? Is it one or is it well, three? Uh, three. Uh, yeah, man, I got three. I'm just like, thank you so much. My, my, you know, when I, when I, my, my daughters, when they were little, I'd come in off the road. They would be hyper on Kool Aid and sugar and jumping. And I looked over one night and I said, "Girls, go to bed. You know, Daddy's got to go to work." And one of my daughters, Abigail, said, "Dad, you don't work. You wrestle." And I thought, man, that's like the greatest book title in the world. So later I wrote my life story and we called it, Dad, You Don't Work, You Wrestle. So that one, and I've got, I went on the road for three weeks with old timers, not to wrestling shows, but at their houses. I spent four days with Black Jack in Florida. I went to Ole Anderson's house. You know what he did? He made me take my shoes off. I'm thinking he's joking. He said, no, you ain't coming in my house till you take your shit. Okay, I took my shoes off. I mean, wow, oh, he's going to kill me in his house. So, and I wrote a story. It's called The Last Wrestler. It's just about uh, Paul Jones. Uh, put him in my car one day, and we just drove around Charlotte, uh, you know, just seeing the old places he used to wrestle at, uh, holding Wahoo McDaniel's hand, uh, James, before he passed, you know, in a hospital in Charlotte. So, a lot of special stories of our, you know, of our heroes and, and then I got a result book, too. Over 10,000 of my matches. People will be tired of reading my name after that. <laughs> yeah. and where I think we... I lost 9,000 of them. And where can we find the book? Is it Amazon? Is it the website? Yeah, 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 yeah they're on Amazon. Of course, georgesouth.com. Uh, it's so simple. We keep it real you know, old school. You just click on it, and then you can go on any of the books, and uh, you can write me and, and, and you know anything. You, my wrestling school information, of course, it's on there. I'm always looking to train, you know, uh, uh, or just, you know, I, I used to beat them up in my day, but now you'll get sued. So now <laughs> I'll just let them beat yourself up. Well, there you go. I'm going to do it on the main camera now. So if you're a yeah. famous wrestler, son or daughter, then George South is the man to go and see to train him. Let me tell you, you that. Thank you so much. But uh, thank yeah. you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you, Chris Appalachian Championship Wrestling, for yeah. setting this interview up. He does quite a lot for me. Uh, and it's always appreciated. And thank you, George, for entertaining us. For oh, thank you. Goodness my knows pleasure. how long. Way over two hours. Thank you. Oh, thank you, my buddy. Thank you.